not understand the concept of love. Come on! Last night at 10 o'clock, we took a look at a new type of roller skate designed by skating enthusiast Scott Olson of Bloomington. Tonight, we look at the sport derived from the invention of the skate. It's the same feeling as skateboard, but... The, we the wheels are on our feet, you know, on stuck on our feet. We can jump over cars and stuff as opposed to a skateboard, you know. The only thing I can define it by is, Boss is the state. incredible individual rebel sport. from the 2000s are being lost to time. Unfortunately, this means many video games from that era have fallen between the cracks. This film aims to highlight the story and experiences derived from such a game. This is the untold story of Sega's estranged masterpiece. Jet Set Radio Future In the world of games, a revolution happens every couple years or so, and another one is upon us, courtesy of Sega. Sonic and Dreamcast will be introduced in Japan on December 27th. Unfortunately, we in the US will have to wait till next fall. Ah, just another day at the office for Peter Moore. President and COO of Sega of America Dreamcast. Our retail receipts for consoles and software will be bigger than the movie receipts of the box office. Sega's dreams and ambitions were bigger than ever before. Sega was the underdog, competing in an uphill battle against two other prominent players, Nintendo and Sony. Hey, plumber boy, mustache man, your worst nightmare has arrived. In order to survive, the Sega Dreamcast had to stand out amongst the crowd. It needed an exclusive selection of games, unique and bold enough to reel in new players. <laughs> What's so wrong? Let's explore this further. We'll wend our way into Sega, pop up the elevator, and take a little look around. What do you say? 
one of the most notable was none other than Jet Set Radio. Developed by Smilebit, Jet Set Radio took Sega's underdog perspective to heart by envisioning a bright and vibrant story that emphasized the importance of free speech and self-expression. It's a game about getting a crew together, blasting band music, and uh, tagging the walls of Cartoon Tokyo, not stopping even when the police tanks roll in, and not stopping when the CEO starts summoning demons. My name is Wooly. I do Let's Plays on uh, YouTube. I grew up as an arcade kid playing fighting games and Jet Set Radio, or Jet Grind Radio at the time, stood out because it was just drastically bold with its visuals. You know, the art director, was, you know, was, I think it's his idea. They were just playing around and came up with the cell shading technique and they didn't really know what they were building. They just came up with this sort of technique and the graphical look and they were all into street culture and things like that. And I think they, they built the game around that. I believe back when uh, Jet Set Radio was first coming out, it came out in Japan. When they were going to port it to America, there was some licensing issues because I believe the term Jet Set was copyrighted. Sega didn't really want to get in trouble with that, so they renamed it to Jet Grind Radio, which, you know, it makes sense given that's what you're doing for most of the game. It's a shame I couldn't use Jet Set Radio because I think that's a really, really cool name, but Jet Grind, you know, it does encompass the whole, you know, roller skating, rollerblading thing, so again, it, work, it works very well for the game. Sega's errors as a company, though, have been well documented. Its last home console flopped, and it's seen its market share plummet from more than 50% to about 1%. Can Dreamcast end Sega's nightmare? They have a lot of, a lot banking on, on the Dreamcast. Again, they're a leap, it's, it's sort of a leap in, in video game technology, and Sega's going to use this to make a comeback into the marketplace. Sadly, however interesting and unique Jet Set Radio's aesthetic may have been, it and the rest of Sega Dreamcast's wild collection of games were not enough to save the console from its imminent death. We had a crew of people who were very um, uh, into being the underdog. I'll allow you to die like a warrior. Oddly enough, becoming the underdog almost galvanized us further. Really brought us together as a team because we knew exactly what we had to do. And they thought, you know, we drop our price, we come out aggressive with all kinds of things, including you could have a free Dreamcast. And it wasn't enough. They, they pushed, they pushed, they pushed. And at the end of Christmas, they hadn't made headway. What are you saying? Rumors started coming out that Sega was no longer manufacturing Dreamcast. No! Although the Sega Dreamcast was discontinued in 2001, Sega's sense of rebellion and desire to craft incomparable digital experiences lived on. Now everyone, let's march to the end of the galaxy. At the time, Microsoft was launching their first console and needed an engaging selection of games to reel in new players. The Xbox is everything The Rock is, cutting edge, powerful, exhilarating, and like The Rock, it will be the most electrifying thing coming out this year. Sega made a deal with Microsoft to have Smilebit, the developers of Jet Set Radio, develop a new exclusive title for the original Xbox. We were able to successfully convert the Sega fan base to other hardware platforms via our games. We were able to explain to gamers, yeah, you can still have your Jet Grind radio, oh, yeah. but it's just going to happen on these other platforms, but we promise you it'll be the same exact wonderful gameplay experience. 
In order to save time and money, Smilebit capitalized on the work they had already done on Jet Set Radio. They did so by revisiting the world of Tokyoto and developing the retro futuristic masterpiece now known as Jet Set Radio Future. Jet Set Radio Future. Jet Set Radio Future. Jet Set Radio Future sets the tone from the get go, eager to tell an inspiring story about gangs of skaters and street artists saving their city from the oppressive grip of a totalitarian police state, all while staying funky to the beats of DJ Professor K. Yeah, this is DJ Professor K, baby, the master of mayhem, know what I'm saying? Bring you another Tokyo Underground Pirate Radio broadcast from Jet Set Radio. I'm gonna bust into your head through your cute little ears and blow your mind with my sexy voice and out of sight sound. Jet Set Radio Future is a futuristic rollerblading. The legendary video game made by Sega, um, originally for the Monster Xbox. Graffiti tagging, street art. The coolest cel-shaded anti-authoritarian graffiti gang skating game ever. Platformer, 3D. I would describe it as an experience. Exploration. It's definitely a game that is life-changing. Uh, amazing game for the Xbox console. And it came free with your Xbox. Yeah, you're a bunch of kids who's rollerblading and are rebels who likes to tag stuff illegally. But it's fun. <laughs> Jet Set Radio Future was not a remake of the original Jet Set Radio, nor was it a sequel. You know, when you remix something, it's not about making it better. It's about it, it maybe extending the life or taking it in a slightly different route. Jet Set Radio Future was an edgier, more polished take with textures more rich in detail and colors more vibrant than ever before. No, you're gonna dig this. The soundtrack became funkier. The characters grew more diverse in style and background, and the story's soul became much deeper and more vocal about the world issues it aimed to address. Smilebit treated Jet Set Radio Future as if it were a futuristic cultural movement, believing that in order for it to succeed, its aesthetic needed to be revolutionary. Revolutionary in the way it looked, in the way it sounded, in the way it felt, especially from the player's perspective. It's a game that really captures an essence and like a period of time. I think people are still holding on to Jet Set Radio Future because a lot of the things that it excels at portraying are still popular today. Like skater culture and rollerblading is super alive. Uh, Hip hop music is still obviously popular as hell. Y2K style and fashion has been doing its thing. And I think it's not just out of nostalgia that these things are still popular, it's that they just all kept their staying power individually. And this is a game that showcases all these things. Jet Set Radio Future released in 2002. The turn of the century pushed people's imaginations to come up with countless ideas of what the future could hold.
JSRF's bright citrus colored vision of tomorrow took and blended many groundbreaking artistic elements of the past in order to create this alternative futuristic masterpiece. With a combination of styles ranging from 1960s and 1970s funk, funkadelic, and Japanese architecture to 1990s hip-hop, rock, and urban scenes, JSRF creates a world of cultural elements from various decades that somehow works. The biggest and brightest artistic elements of the game come from Tokyo Toe's high-rises, covered in a blend of faded logos, neon ads, and bright graffiti. But what gives Jet Set Radio Future its visual voice is not simply the bright and colorful aspects that seem to be the loudest, but rather the exposition of that juxtaposed to the grungy, grimy, rundown textures and atmospheres that exist down below. In the alleyways, sewers, industrial zones, and overcrowded residential neighborhoods, JSRF aims to paint a picture of a believable world as diverse and expansive as the palette of music, fashion, and character designs it offers. of quirky characters from Jet Set Radio made a triumphant and transformative return in Jet Set Radio Future. In a few interviews before the release of Jet Set Radio Future, Smilebit insinuated that JSRF exists in a separate universe parallel to that of JSR. Smilebit staff also went on to say that some characters have returned and grown up since the last time players encountered them. But these weren't just familiar characters all grown up. The characters in Jet Set Radio Future were reimaginings of familiar manga-like icons from Jet Set Radio. Only this time, they were embedded in the retro-futuristic setting of Tokyo To. Come along, children. Now we're going to have a little music. Like old time. Like old time. So now I'll start the melody on the organ. A place where citizens work hard, corrupt politicians and consumerism rule the land, and the fragility of peace is constantly tested by being pushed to the brink. Oh, 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 oh. It's here that we meet JSRF's unforgettable cast of characters. They love to skate, but they're all different. All of the characters are modeled to fit their own unique personality. It's just done so perfectly. If I had to choose one that would be my favorite character, it would have to be Cube, honestly. Realistically speaking, why I choose her is because she's the golf girl representation that's in skating communities now. <laughs> my favorite character has to be Boogie, mainly because she is one of the only black female characters in the game. You can get a vibe of what their personality would be like, and I really like hers. Obviously, I feel she's most relatable to me. Characters like Beat, Gum, and Corn tend to take the spotlight in JSRF's mainstream marketing. Meanwhile, other characters like Jazz, Cube, Combo, Yo-Yo, and Soda tend to be well-known cult favorites. It's a brand new day in Tokyo. 
Kyoto. Headlining the news is the recent statement from Goji Rokaku on the graffiti gains plaguing the city. Quote, my Rokaku forces are on patrol in all major metropolitan areas to make sure these terrorists are behind bars where they belong. <laughs> Tokyo is being oppressed by the Rokaku Group, a mega enterprise headed by Rokaku Goji. Rokaku is using his money and influence to mess with everything, industry, society, and even our culture. And he's even got his eyes set on City Hall. Lately, Rokaku's been shaking down the government, passing that Rokaku law crap, even buying off the police department. This law ain't nothing but garbage. It's just some selfish little punk's way of trying to show he's a big man. Rokaku and his gang are trying to stomp out our culture left and right. They don't give a rip about our rights. All they care about is profit. And some spineless fools have already become flunkies in that diabolical scheme. You better believe they're listening on this broadcast. But even in all this heat, there's a group of young kids who've been tearing up the streets. The hottest team at the moment is the GGs. There's Yo-Yo, a guy who blow your mind with silver yeah. tongue. And Gum, a real cool lady who leaves a trail of broken hearts wherever she goes. And let's, let's not forget go. their leader, a self-styled genius that goes by the name of Corn. These three in your garden variety Little. street punks. Know what I'm saying? Lately, Tokyo's been on one bad trip. The attack on the record store in Chuo Street, prowlers in Dogenzaka Hill, lowlife spreading vicious rumors, the mysterious blackout on 99th Street. And who should be following them around but the Rokaku Group's watchdog, the Rokaku Police. With the Rokaku Expo just around the corner, the crackdowns are only getting tighter. My heart ain't pounded like this since since my first date. I was so nervous, know what I'm saying? I forgot to wear my underwear, baby. This ain't the time to be sitting around sipping afternoon tea. Game's gonna start soon, and y'all gonna be the one making the plays. In Jet Set Radio Future, DJ Professor K is one of the best representations of the hip-hop scene. From his funky choice of diction to his street smart advice, he looks out for the community that is being oppressed and excluded from society by giving them insight and guidance via Jet Set Radio. The station that's so smooth, your ears won't even know what hit them. Jet Set Radio! In the original Jet Set Radio game on Dreamcast, DJ Professor K took on a much less significant role. The reimagining of his character in Jet Set Radio Future became much more personal as he voiced his concern and care for the player, the GGs, the graffiti gang the player is a part of, and ultimately anyone in need. Who's gonna rise to the call? Remember, the streets don't wait for no one. Yo! At the beginning of the game, the player joins a gang called the GGs. You know, the GGs are the they're the they're the G's. Like they're the they're the heroes. If you if you really look at the kinds of places you go outside of the GG hideout, I see commercialism, like people uh, really gathered up outside of stores. I see underdeveloped areas of the city that have tons of like construction going on and areas that look like they were, you know, abandoned. The environments in the game are seem to be a lot bigger and a lot more expansive than the first game. And there are so many different paths you can take. But also, you're as you're playing the game, you're taking in so much of the surrounding environments, you know, whether it's shop fronts, apartment blocks, these little kind of side alleys, these underground passages. Those kind of things are just totally unique. It really feels like there is this small little artistic scene uh, right in the middle of Tokyo Toe. And the graffiti that you're putting out, uh, you're putting that over advertisements. You're putting that in this area that can be really devoid of life, honestly. Like, I love that the game isn't afraid to get muddy and ugly with some of its textures and have you kind of paint beauty over that. It's not long after that the player is introduced to a variety of other lively, creatively costumed gangs throughout the city of Tokyo Toe. The game took a unique approach towards imagining comic book-like characters and stories and applying them to gang culture. Each gang identifies with specific colors. This was more than likely inspired by gang culture in both Japan and the United States during the 1990s. Gangs like the Love Shockers, the Immortals, and Rapid 99 
take to the streets to claim their turf. As the player wins friendly competitions in turf battles, members of those gangs join the player's gang, the GGs, becoming unlockable and playable characters. Gangs can be toxic, dangerous, and violent. But in Jet Set Radio Future, the violence is limited and the player becomes a part of a gang that fights back using art and freedom of speech as their weapons of choice. Passions are something that make individuals stand out amongst the crowd. And in Jet Set Radio Future, passion exists behind each and every character. Their passion and identities are expressed in a variety of ways that make them feel fully fleshed out and believable. Iconic character designs ranging from 1960s sci-fi to 2000s goth are paired with signature dance moves to match the style and individuality of each playable character. I love character design because the way a character acts, looks, and is shaped can tell you everything about the character without them having to say anything. The use of diversity and representation in Jet Set Radio Future is one of the best that I've seen. With like nationalities, there's definitely different type of nationalities there, African-American and then there's Asian. There's a healthy amount of female characters as well as black characters and characters of color. You have a youthful and racially diverse cast of characters representing the melting pot that formed new music styles like funk and hip hop in America. Jet Set Radio or Jet Set Radio Future really aims to like feed you this diversity and representation of different cultures in like one special unit to where it makes sense and it under it's understandable. It would have been weird to have a game so inspired by like black music culture and not have any black characters in it. So uh, I'm glad that didn't happen. <laughs> that would have been again a little bit odd. <laughs> I think it's done in a way that isn't so negatively stereotypical. There's also like diverse looking NPCs, like there's people with different body types and different styles. It was really ahead of its time. The creators of the game didn't have a closed mind and they use an open mind and imagination and choose different types of unique characteristics. Seeing faces, builds, and personalities as diverse as these made the fictional, globalized city of Tokyoto more and more believable. Having a diverse cast of counterculture characters like this truly makes Jet Set Radio Future feel ahead of its time. I believe every character in that game, uh, although you aren't explicitly told this in the story, is kind of undergoing their own path and having their own like version of this revolution that's happening. Each character holds a unique set of stats to match their personality and style. These stats can range anywhere from the amount of graffiti cans you can hold to the stamina needed to run from the police and pull off successful skating tricks. You just want to get in trouble, do the hustle, everybody. Through every aspect of Jet Set Radio Future, Smilebit made sure to encourage free speech and creativity. The graffiti left on the walls will remind people of their inner passions. It'll burn into their minds, and the dreams of the city will be carried on through the streets. human nature to seek ways of exercising one's ability to express oneself. Every individual is uniquely different, every mind an independent universe of its own. From funkadelic costumes and character designs to unconventional music and street art, Jet Set Radio Future sets out to make self-expression one of the main and most recognizable themes of the game. 
is your heart pounding with the beat? Am I getting through to you? Show me what you got. I'm counting on y'all. The player literally takes down the entire Rakaku Corporation and saves the city of Tokyo to with nothing but a spray can. Although the spray can can be seen as a symbol of rebellion, in this case, it is highly emphasized more so as a symbol of free speech. By the end of the game, the player has experienced countless events that encourage and remind the player that free speech and unity are the ultimate weapons. Now check out the wicked inspiration vibe. Compared to Jet Set Radio, Jet Set Radio Future's graffiti creation tool was much more elaborate and imaginative as it offered players new futuristic ways of expressing themselves. In the early 2000s, skating games grew in popularity due to the immense success of the Tony Hawk Pro Skater series. Such memories. Yeah, this is pretty cool. This may have swayed Smilebit's decision to shift their focus from technical graffiti mechanics in Jet Set Radio to technical skating mechanics in Jet Set Radio Future. In order to do tricks successfully, players must successfully match their style of trick with various rhythms. Even though this is not a rhythm-based game, when you're skating, it's like you're skating to the beat, especially to certain songs. This silent mechanic amplified the importance of Jet Set Radio Future's iconic soundtrack. Suddenly, a player's success depended on their attentiveness to the beats of the music they listened to. In addition, Smilebit took the name Jet to heart as they incorporated a new critical and exhilarating feature to the game, Jet Boosting. Jet Set Radio. This feature allowed players to not only feel as though they were skating in the future, but this new form of transportation enhanced the player's ability to explore Tokyo Toe's open world in a new and exciting way. scene of Jet Set Radio Future paints a perfect representation of the hip-hop scene of the early 2000s and its influence on cultures across the world. At the time, artists like Eminem, Snoop Dogg, Missy Elliott, Jay-Z, and Nas were releasing some of the most impactful albums of all time. Other artists like Linkin Park released albums that did what hip-hop does best invent new sounds and new ways of conveying the same soul of the genre. Four elements. There's DJing, there's breaking, there's graffiti, and then there's the MC. Top of the food chain. A deep knowledge of hip hop is what's always separated Jet Set Radio from its imitators. And anyone who focuses on copying the surface level aesthetic of the games instead of looking back at the history and the inspirations, they may miss this, that all the major elements of hip hop are present in this game. It included like DJing, it included MCing, dancing, tagging, you know, all the four elements of hip hop are like 
right there. Well, hip hop culture was definitely a big influence on Jet Set Radio Future. I can say that with a, a degree of authority because I knew the culture, I grew up with the culture as it was happening. Uh, you have a youthful and racially diverse cast of characters representing the melting pot that formed new music styles like funk and hip hop in America. So many other games treat hip hop like a costume or a remix or like a genre to have their composer do as a novelty when their composer doesn't really make hip hop. <laughs> Just that Radio Future, however, understands that it is an entire cultural music and if you're going to take one part of it, you need to kind of take all of it. I mean, I was in a a sort of gang, but it was just a bunch, bunch of guys I used to hang around with, really. There's nothing sinister about it. We used to have dance battles and, you know, MC battles and DJ battles, which was kind of funny being a, a white middle-class kid from the UK, but that's what everyone was doing. That, that was the, the time. Wait, y'all, could you do it right this time for yeah. us? Let's just rap could you do a little it right? bit. Let's just rap a little right bit. Now. become an underground cultural movement and its distribution was homemade. You couldn't purchase albums or records and you couldn't hear hip hop on the radio. The only way that you could participate in the culture musically was through these cassette tapes, which would circulate all throughout the city. Similarly, in the world of JSRF, cassettes are spread throughout the city of Tokyo to waiting for the player to find them. With each new mystery tape, the player unlocks new possibilities in the game. The street challenges that are unlocked help the player to see the streets and the city in a new light and from a new perspective. Hip hop evolved and adapted to the coming times, never falling behind and proving to be a genre that is here to stay. Although the beats can be catchy, it is the community surrounding the hip hop scene that have allowed the genre to stick around for so long. <laughs> to this day, this genre is used as a platform to speak out against controversial topics and issues that continue to plague our society. Issues like systemic racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, classism, ageism, and police brutality. Hip-hop, more often than not, is a genre that is constantly innovating new impactful ways of delivering its messages. Wild and wonderful music. Why is the music important aspect of Just a Radio Future, you say? I think it's important because it gives you a vibe, it gives you a mood. It's not just the score of the gameplay, it's the in-universe sound of like the counterculture that the Rudys are listening to and, and, and what they're trying to establish. It's mandatory to their survival. Pirate Radio is giving them the updates on what's going on in the city, where the danger is coming from and such. So when you're putting together that soundtrack that they're listening to, you're putting together their lives as well. The station that'll teach you the things your parents and teachers are too afraid to. Jet Set Radio! Now class, open your books to page 32. A pirate radio station in its concept is a collection of people that decide that they want to broadcast usually a specific genre, a specific type of music, but it's technically not legal because they don't have a broadcasting license. They don't have commercial sponsorship, so it does come with an element of risk. Disclaimer, I don't condone anyone breaking the law. A lot of different things. Some, there have been a couple stations, not that many. The FCC believes that all stations are on because they're frustrated DJs who just aren't good enough to get jobs. And uh, they aren't good enough to make it in the, in the commercial segments, so they have to resort to, to pirating. That's what they think, but there have been only a couple stations like that. Most of them are just people, either DJs or regular people or whatever, who have an interest in radio and they want to put on whatever they put on. Hey, hey. 
This is Hideki Naganuma, aka CEO of Funky Fresh Beats. Hideki Naganuma's the man. That's that dude right there. If he's, if he's listening, hi, Naganuma san.、Uh, he's one of the people that just at Radio Future would just absolutely not be the same without.、Uh, who is Hideki Naganuma? DJ Skank Funk himself. Hideki Naganuma is the composer of the majority of Sega's Jet Set Radio and Jet Set Radio Future. He is an absolute treasure of a video game composer. Not so much as a social media personality, maybe, but I wish there were more composers like him. Hideki is a genius. And I think he now has the,、uh, the online moniker of Funky Uncle, I think he calls himself, which is definitely very appropriate. You didn't know he did make music also for Sonic Rush? I'm not sure if he's still in house, but he was an in house composer with Sega Japan throughout the 90s and 2000s. Let's get scratching. In 2001, Naganuma, a musician since childhood, was hired on by Smilebit to come back and work on Jet Set Radio Future. He also came into video games with an understanding of popular commercial music, an understanding that he has his own personal take on styles like hip hop, funk, and rock music. And he has such a very unique. Style that I think is perfect for the setting and the essence of Jet Set Radio Future. With Jet Set Radio, the game was a bit of an experiment. With Jet Set Radio Future, Naganuma came in fluent in the language of the story taking place. He was familiar with the game's characters, themes, tone, settings, and atmospheres. This helped him gain a clearer vision of how to implement a necessary new dimension to the game. Hideki Naganuma masterfully sampled the work he had done for the original Jet Set Radio soundtrack. He then used those samples to reimagine the voices of Tokyo To, painting them in a futuristic light, rich in funk, hip hop, rock, and techno. His brain for just what sounds great as a beat is just all, all over the place. And if you take one listen to these songs, you'll realize that this guy is truly the king of samples. This collage of sounds built a bold, bright, and fun soundtrack to match the game's aesthetic. Hideki just, I mean, he smashed it. I mean, people love what he put together for the soundtrack. I really admire that he was able to make two distinct sounds for Jet Set Radio and Future, but also have them echo each other and represent like sounds of the past and the future. I mean, the way he ran it together, he kind of DJed the whole thing. What's the funk one called? The funky dealer, baby. The funky dealer, that's my favorite one. Can we get a second take on that? Yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite song off the Jet Set Radio feature? Other、song? than my own?、Uh, it's illegal to say your own. Oh. Then I guess my second favorite would be. Funky dealer, baby. Funky Dealer is a masterstroke of sampling that best fits the action and the vibrance of the game. It's not just sampling to have more realistic instrument sounds, it's sampling because of the edge it gives to the production. The soundtrack was not only good, it was great. So great that it remains one of the sole reasons gamers continue coming back to this game decades later. You know, the, the speed is it's like, it's kind of trippy because, like, you hear, like, oh, dude, gosh, 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 gosh. Ah, Basically, break beats like sped up, you know what I mean? And、um, funk lines and the way he just blended it all together. It was just super creative. It matched the graphics so good. I mean, obviously, there's a reason that this has resonated with people for this long. It was great. I was able to have revelations about my own music from studying his. His musical style is like visible or sort of audible in the music that I make now because of how much I look up to him as an inspiration. 
The beats, rhythms, and melodies throughout Jet Set Radio Future's soundtrack shapes the environments of the game with cinematic futuristic soundscapes. The songs Hideki Naganuma composed for Jet Set Radio Future's original soundtrack were designed in recognition of the story itself to display elements that echoed the diabolical and controversial experiences that lived on in the streets. These songs were composed in a way that included samples from activists like Stokely Carmichael in the song The Concept of Love. Ah, the concept of love just it 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 starts inside and it just fires up the you get the tingles in your spine it's quintessential i love concept of love i just think it embodies everything about the game it was the first track that hideki played me that he was working on and i thought it already gave the game a more futuristic sound but keeping true to the original this song most recognized for being the title song of the game Samples specifically from Stokely Carmichael's speech, titled Free Huey. It was here that Naganuma recognized elements of the speech that mirrored those playing out in the fictional world of Tokyo To. Elements critical to activist movements, specifically to those fighting uphill battles for the sake of free speech, freedom, identity, and equality. Who is Richard Jakes? Richard Jakes is a really awesome British composer. Hi, my name is Richard Jakes and I'm a video game composer. I've been working in the industry almost 30 years. My relationship with Jet Set Radio Future began after having previously worked on Jet Set Radio. So I did one track for Jet Set Radio and that track was called Everybody Jump Around. Jump, 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 jump around. My involvement with Jet Set Radio Future began, I believe it was in late 2000 or early 2001, when my producer at Sega Europe told me that Sega Japan were going to be making a sequel, this time for the for the Xbox console. And they asked if I could do two new original tracks. And so I composed a track called What About the Future? and another one called Bok Fresh. And then I was also asked to remix Hideki Naganuma's track from the first Jet Set Radio game, which was called Let Mum Sleep. And by the way, most of the credit should go to him for sort of coming up with the, the overall style. In essence, I was given pretty much a free reign, to, especially with What About the Future. That track, I was able to make it a lot more electronic than the others, possibly, and it's a bit more sort of futuristic breaks. I have faith that there is a future for us. What About the Future is a banger. And the first time I heard that song, I started pop locking, bruh, because that stuff was clean. The beats in What About the Future, they they, they are quite regular, but they there's a little kind of skippy feel every four bars-ish, and there's a lot of interplay, so it, it keeps your interest. It reflects the kind of music I was listening to at the time, and it was popular in especially a lot of underground clubs here in London, and I wanted to just take that a bit further, whilst making it still appropriate for the game. You know, it couldn't be so dark that it didn't fit with the game. Breakbeat is a a UK genre at its core and being that its presence is huge in Jet Set Radio Future especially I think it's perfect that Richard was part of the Jet Set Radio games Here we go. 
But when I first thought about the tracks, I think it was Bok Fresh that I wrote first. I suppose I took a lot of inspiration from what Hideki Naganuma was already doing because he has a wonderful mixture of sort of funk and hip hop and soul. And he's definitely got a sense of humor. So it makes it fun. It, it makes it a really great sense of fun playing the game with those tracks. So for Bok Fresh, I, I took a similar approach. You know, there's some quite funny samples in there. Bok Fresh is one of my favorite songs from the series. And I feel like his contribution and everybody jump around fits in really well with what Hideki Naganuma was doing as the primary composer. Let's look at the funk. His remix of Let Mom Sleep for Jet Set Radio Future is also a big, big favorite of mine. I was honored that Naganuma-san wanted me to remix it. Sometimes, some days, I, I even prefer it over the original. Kick up the tempo a little bit. I wanted to, m to make the bass kind of a bit heavier and a bit more energetic because that's what the rest of the tracks that Naganuma-san was composing for Jet Set Radio Future, he was already going more in a faster, sort of slightly more punchier, more energy into the tracks. <laughs> With the sirens, that's basically transform scratching, and I sort of wanted to get that element in there. And I think I used about three or four different bass synths all, all put together and made it really, really fat and really big in the bottom end. Even though he's only contributed five or so tracks and remixes to the series overall, he is extremely important to the soundtracks and really looms large. He's a little bit underrated. My last game at Sega as an in-house composer was with the Jet Set Radio Future. And, you know, I was honored to be asked back to contribute to uh, the second soundtrack. <laughs> The Beastie Boys, the game-changing rap rock group, left Def Jam Recordings to create their own vanity record label, Grand Royal. You want something done right, you'd better do it yourself. Clearly, the Beastie Boys live by this motto. Now, with their second self-produced album and new slick publication, they're one step closer to taking over the world as a burgeoning multimedia conglomerate. Simply put, it was a label by artists who were tired of the system and wanted to produce music on their own terms. It was a safe space for the bold, edgy, underground scene to be heard. Grand Royal featured artists like Scapegoat Wax, BS2000. All right, listen, we're BS2000. This first song is called Sick for a Reason, and it's an anti-police brutality song, motherfuck Mayor Giuliani of New York City. Chibo Motto and the Latch Brothers, a Beastie Boys side project. One of my favorite songs ever from the soundtrack definitely has to be The Answer by the Latch Brothers. <laughs> It sounds like it could go on forever, and I wouldn't be mad if it did. Oh, where is it? Oh, Scapegoat Wax. I'm Marty James, singer of Scapegoat Wax. Scapegoat Wax got signed to Grand Royal in the year 2000. I mean, it was my intro to the music industry, being on Grand Royal. I grew up pretty much idolizing the Beastie Boys. They were definitely a massive influence on me, you know, wanting to pursue music. So it was like a dream come true. Grand Royal was pretty cutting edge with like what they're trying to accomplish and how they just focus around like what they like. Like Sega's Dreamcast, Grand Royal provided refuge for the freedom of creativity and encouraged self-expression and individuality. That's why I wanted to be on the label so much. It was like, these guys are artists. It's always dope having somebody that's an artist at your label who sees your vision. Record label, Grand Royal, started as an infomercial early on. That didn't work out. These friends of ours, Lester Jackson, they go back a long way with us. Had their demo tape when we were on the Check Your Head tour. Listened to it a lot, decided to put it out. Because, you know, the infomercial thing wasn't working out. So we figured, okay, we'll be a regular. After years of accruing massive debts, Grand Royal closed its doors in 2001. Its near 10-year run not only produced and distributed game-changing music, it became the prominent voice for the underground scene it had created. You know, in the end, it kind of sucked because, like, the label went out of business. And so it was hard because they had really become, like, my family at that label. It was pretty tight-knit for, like, two years. 
Although the label disbanded, its cultural influences lived on. Following the closure of Grand Royal, Sega hired Grand Royal to produce original songs for Jet Set Radio Future. It's time you let your go, 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 go. Into the new dance and tell. Also allowed Hideki Naganuma to handpick a selection of songs from Grand Royal to be featured on Jet Set Radio Future's official soundtrack. They've very carefully chosen both the original music and the licensed music, and I think it's amazing how how well they fit together and what they bring to the game. There's not one that sticks out, and you think, oh, that doesn't belong in this game. You know, he kind of had a big selection to pick from that was working with Sega, and he just looked for stuff that was the right vibe for the culture the game was trying to again establish. The artists featured were, in their own right, individually stylistic, away from the norm, rebellious spirits. Some of the most well-known Grand Royal tracks selected included songs like Birthday Cake by Chibo Mato. And Aisle 10 by Scapegoat Wax. When you're skating and that kicks in and it's like, oh, we're dropping the tempo down a little bit. Then you hear, I seen you at my job. Aisle 10 is the palate cleanser. You know, between your pieces of sushi, it's a bit of that. It kind of like resets the pace before the BPM jumps back again. What really happened to happen in a video store. You know, I was working at a video store in Chico, California, on Walnut Street called All the Best Video, what up? Wearing my purple vest, fitted up in there just hollering at the college girls that would come in there, you know, maybe breaking them off of free Twix. I had to go put those movies back on the shelf, holding them this high, you know, and I'm sitting here making four something an hour. Uh, I'm getting some ice cream out of this. And there really was a girl and I really thought she was cute and I thought this was gonna be my finesse. It, I actually went home and I wrote, hello, Allison, I don't know. I had like just written it. Pretty much the song came together off of that. I, I found a guitar sample, I slowed it down, detuned it wrote it, had it to the drum beat I had and the guitar. I was singing that to myself and I started kind of humming the bass line in a way like, I want some funk, you know? Music and video games wasn't, you know, what it is now, you know what I mean? And so I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. Not really realizing how many people were gonna play that game. And, and around 2006, I started kind of realizing like, oh wow, people really love this game and really are dedicated to this game and has a, a, a deep cult following. It's a pretty diehard group of uh, fans. What a lot of people say, what really kind of makes my day is like when they say it reminds me of their childhood. I, I feel very honored to have a part in some people's nostalgia. When I started looking around online, you know, I would search Scapegoat Wax on Twitter and I saw a lot of like love. Just that radio, man, kept the name alive. And Scapegoat Wax actually got a little low key cult following from a lot of this, you know, a lot of the Jet Set love. Yeah, I, want, I have my label Mighty Oak and I love I love looking at it like, you know, how could you make a Grand Royal, you know, today? And, you know, something that has some grassroots to it, but also has some just out of the box elements and just something that, you know, moves people as a whole. It's cold. Cold. Ice cold snow glow. Atop the mechanics of the game, lie a variety of cultural influences. In order to better understand the root of why these influences were incorporated, we must first take a deep dive into understanding a Japanese genre and subculture that inspired Smilebit's philosophical and stylistic approach towards Jet Set Radio Future's sights, sounds, and presentation overall. We see elements of American pop culture as very cutesy, the same way that you see ours. That's a quote from Konishi Yasuharu in 1996, being arguably the man behind Shibuya K. Obviously, we've taken lots of American and English music and sort of regurgitated it, but we've thrown your culture back in your faces slightly skewed. That quote essentially summarizes Shibuya K, the genre.
My name is Andrew. I'm a record collector, filmmaker, and music enthusiast. The 90s were this wonderful time of musical genre bending and discovering and technology and cultural changes. The Shibuya Fashion and Shopping District in Tokyo housed many of the world's best record stores, all of which in very close proximity, along with, of course, some of Japan's most innovative musicians. At the same time, in the early 90s, Britain had Britpop, France had French House, electronic music was just getting more and more vibrant and experimental, and this was all thanks to the early sampling and synth and production equipment and stuff like that that was becoming more and more accessible to the masses. Sampling is, in my opinion, it's very similar to how the culture has remix the classics, how jazz remix show tunes, you know, it's it's very much an ode to what came before. This was also the first time in history where you could get your hands basically on any music from anywhere in the world, no matter who you were. What you had were a lot of musical scenes where it was essentially a game of who can get their hands on the most obscure music and show it off in the most interesting way through sampling and production. For me, it stems from records, vinyl, producers, beat makers, DJs, digging through the crates, finding a loop that they love, finding something that the drum break, a sample, a stab, a horn. You know, you can sample off anything, really. You can hear something off TV, sample it in, make a beat out of it. People who think that sampling is done just because we don't want to work on music as long or skip some steps or because we don't have our own ideas, they're really missing the whole point. Some people think of it as ripping off and then in theory, I guess you could say that, but it's also reinventing what's worked before. And it's all it's happened through music all through time. I think sampling plays a huge part in Jet Set Radio Future in all of the pieces of music that you hear, because I would guess that any drum programming would have been done in a in a hardware sampler. Again, this is before real software samplers were a thing. There was no VSTs, there was no plugins at this time. I love you. I love you. <laughs> Sampling is a massive part of Jet Set Radio Future. It can't really be overstated. The soundtrack would be completely different. Lots of game music uses samples. Uh, once the hardware got to a certain point, you know, the sound chips and side consoles were being used to play back samples that composers recorded from their keyboards or imported in some other way. But that's not the way Jet Set Radio Future samples. That's not the reason it samples. Uh, it does it the same way that contemporary music of its time sampled. Sampling was a global phenomenon. Artists abroad, especially in France, for example, like Air or Daft Punk or America's Beck, were creating a very suspiciously similar style of music right around the same time. Underground communities and labels were actually quite interconnected. Shibuya K sort of epitomizes the concept of the referential cut and paste musical style that was becoming more and more popular at the time. Played quietly, it's like geisha girls sipping milkshake through stripy straws and played loud, it's the Osaka earthquake. I think a lot of musically inclined people find something very alluring about a genre that is familiar, but also takes the sounds that you know and love and throws them back to you in this sort of like warped hall of mirrors kind of way. Japan's music market is second in size only to America. So here you have a genre of music that came from one of the most vibrant trendy districts on the planet during one of the most interesting periods of time in music with a budget afforded by producers and record labels embedded in a local you know record and shopping scene where i think investors were very aware of what was going on and wanted to cash in on the action when we bring up the fact that japan has the world's second largest music market we should also appreciate the fact that post-war Japan, with the technological and economic boom that was happening, that's what really caused a lot of the technology that would shape the way that music sounded from, you know, like the 70s into the 80s into the 90s. Production equipment, synths, sampling equipment, everything from the extravagant production of 
80s city pop forward until today in one way or another influence music trends moving into the future but there's also another really big aspect with the way that japan changed culturally after the war post-war japan was sort of the earliest japan really had any tolerance for westernized media this period of time from the 50s forward until the 70s marked a big cultural shift towards personal freedoms and democracy there's two musicians who are sort of the most important and influential and sort of spearheaded the genre. The first is Pizzicato 5. Uh, that's Kodishi Yasuharu's group. It was eventually joined by Maki no Miya. And they make essentially this like loungy, bossa nova, upbeat dance type music, which is kind of all held together by this really tight production and sampling. It's sort of like a 1960s, very kitschy kind of vibe. The second most important musician is Cornelius or Keigo Oyamada or Flipper's Guitar in its earliest iteration, where Keigo Oyamada and Konishi Yasuharu differed initially was that Konishi was quite a bit more inclined to make electronic oriented dance type music and Keigo Oyamada was a lot more like indie pop guitar style. Really early on in the picture, they started actually working and collaborating and producing each other's music and all these kinds of things. Their styles just wove in and out of each other's and they really influenced each other a lot. And that's kind of where the genre came from. There's some other really important artists in the scene as well. Toa Te, Fantastic Plastic Machine, Lamp. A lot of these musicians actually differ quite vastly in terms of sound. Whether they base their style more around hip hop beats or like French pop or indie sounds or electronica or jazz or down tempo, Shibuya K's musical philosophy has more to do with the concept of curation and sampling as well as sort of like nostalgia and genre bending. There's more of a unifying sensibility of stylistic exploration than there is a set of concrete rules about what is and isn't Shibuya K. Even though sampling was crucial to the genre, so were some of the musical techniques and motifs that were kind of stereotypical of Shibuya K. Saudad de Futura, which is the nostalgia for the future. That's like a bossa nova thing. It's just this recurring theme. Not only does it play really well into the sampling and the crate digging, but it also fit perfectly into the ironic anti consumer kind of attitude that some people had. The overall vibe of Shibuya K has this like obsession with consumerism, fashion, and the culture of like shopping and travel. It all has this super ironic bent to it, which was very critical of that lifestyle. Shibuya K became a fashion and visual style that did spill into the mainstream and took on this like youthful kind of hipster look to it that was really appealing to a young audience. Walker! Sort of went from, you know, the end of the 80s until probably the turn of the century. And the reason that it fell out of fashion was it, it actually became so popular that it just sort of got absorbed by, you know, corporations. You know, once you start hearing stuff in like minivan commercials, like it's not, it's not cool anymore. By the turn of the century, pop culture in Japan was suffering from Shibuya K fatigue a condition with symptoms of exhaustion and disdain towards the Shibuya K approach. While it has never been officially stated, it is believed that one of the many reasons Jet Set Radio Future did not sell well commercially in Japan was because of Shibuya K fatigue. Although Jet Set Radio Future incorporates a collage of cultures and aesthetics, in Japan, Shibuya K was probably the most recognizable of them all.
I think Hideki picked songs like Birthday Cake because it was just so weird and obscure that fits the vibe of that game. Ladies and gentlemen, Shiba Mato, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Chibo Mato was a New York-based band consisting of Miho Hattori and Yuka Honda. Despite being located in the U.S. and having early roots releasing material under the BC Boys Grand Royal record label, they had strong links to the Shibuya K scene in Tokyo. And throughout their career, they would sort of mingle with people from that scene in one way or another. Chibo Mato was definitely one of the most interesting musicians in the scene as a whole. Uh, they fully embraced the attitude of experimentation and genre bending. And this was quite visible in their choice of collaborations from working with the John Spencer Blues Explosion to briefly joining Gorillaz. They've been involved or toured with Yoko Ono, John Zorn, Sonic Youth, and Japan's own Yellow Magic Orchestra. And looking back at the Japanese scene, Yumiko Ono of the Shibuya K adjacent band Buffalo Daughter also contributed and worked with them as well. I think Chibo Mato is really interesting because a lot of their discography would really just fit perfectly into the Shibuya K world. By a lot of metrics, it is Shibuya K, but I think through their careers, they sort of had this like identity crisis where they were clearly influenced by a lot of this work at home and that definitely came through in their music. But I think they struggled, especially in their relationships with like news and media that people would ask them, well, is your music Japanese? They would always have to insist that their music was American. After all, they are American and they're working with American people People and they're making music for Americans on a daily basis. It also didn't help that their involvement with Yoko Ono was pretty prolific, but I think despite some naive questions, you know, from confused reporters and people like that, the duo was generally pretty stoked that Americans were like embracing and buying and importing all this Japanese media. When Kay asked me to do this bit for the video, I would have probably mentally placed Chiba Mato somewhere between, you know, Cornelius or Takako Minakawa or Hai Posse or Halkali or and some of these artists. But out of respect for the way that they wish to identify musically and artistically and culturally, they were part of the 90s USA like Beck type indie music canon. Like that's that's where they live. This movement, like yeah, it did sound a certain way in Japan, but I think this is a really interesting case of where that genre definitely spilled overseas and it's not often so clear exactly where it came from. I think it was definitely more of a global movement than people seem to acknowledge. And it definitely wasn't just limited to Japan. In short, Sibomato was a 90s art pop alt-rock, Shibuya K, hip-hop, experimental group with a short but intriguing discography. Although the array of character designs and funky beats in Jet Set Radio Future are often tied to hip-hop and rock scenes, they seem to be most inspired by Parliament Funkadelic. I ain't a winner, pay the front line, take the don't. Not to turn this into a history lesson, but in order to understand Parliament Funkadelic, and how it relates to Jet Set Radio Future, we must first go back in time to the 1940s. Well, it's over and over, over and over. You know, long time before I got with the Drifters, I was with the Crowns, the Five Crowns, and uh, we used to sing on the street corner of 8th Avenue. It used to be the Cadillacs on one corner, it used to be the Five Crowns on one corner, the Hop Tones on another corner. You know, you, you light the fire in the garbage can and, and you take a little nip or something and then you hit a little doo-wop song. Doo-wop was a new sound, a new competitive scene that took pop culture by storm. Its soft, sweet sound was a fun and bright spin on swing and jazz. However, many minority communities who participated in the doo-wop scene grew tired of having to conform to the Americanized white way of doing things. Now he's sitting there with his head hung 
low. Tears falling from his eyes on the floor, he's crying. Oh, really? The parliaments, uh, they were more of a doo-wop type of a group. The doo-wop scene was, it was like a competitive type of thing. You know, who had the best do, who had the prettiest suit on, and who did the, the funkiest steps. When you hear a lot of that early stuff, you just go, why did you ever attempt to try to fit in? Y'all were always going that way. Just give up. And eventually, they were forced to give up. We couldn't keep our ties alike, couldn't keep the suits clean, hair was always undone. You realize the reality of that was really silly, especially when the hippies had just hit the scene and it was hip to be, you know, funky looking. We didn't have no whole bunch of hit records to do it anyway, so it was natural for us to become hippies. Oh, hell was breaking loose. Riots in the hood, Vietnam, LSD. The Parliament's transmutrified into a wild-ass rock group with two record deals under two different names, Parliament and Funkadelic. I think Funk inspired Jet Set Radio Future definitely for the Parliament Funkadelic influence. There's a retro future look that was very popular in Funk. It's a really optimistic, hopeful, and rebellious genre of music. So I think it matches the themes of the game. I think it matches standing up and being yourself, all that stuff. Just the covers, their album covers would just get my attention. And I would read the little comic strip. And then, you know, I hear my brother listening to this crazy psychedelic space funk record, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, I was hooked. Funk is fun, and it's, and it's, um, it's a state of mind. But it's also all the ramifications of that state of mind. You know, once you do the best you can, funk it. Funk gave birth to and inspired many groovy, melodic, and electronic genres in the decades to come. Some of those include hip hop, EDM, boogie, and Parliament Funkadelic. Although many of these, especially funk, helped inspire the multicultural scene of Jet Set Radio Future, it is none other than Parliament Funkadelic that inspired it the most. They're an amazing band, and you know I love I love listening to Parliament Funkadelic. I love their tracks. Um, that must have influenced my style as well. We interrupt the musical portion of our program to bring you a special broadcast from our Parliament. Parliament Funkadelic is a term referring to a collective of musicians that rotate and play alongside the likes of George Clinton and the bands Parliament, formerly a doo-wop group, and Funkadelic. Clinton wanted to create a scene that mirrored the structure of Motown. He went on to create various bands to produce a variety of music, with each project cycling through a roster of artists that implemented themes of Afrofuturism, psychedelic rock, and funk into their musical styles. Parliament Funkadelic created a world of its own, a world constantly inventing new mythology, sounds, characters, and fashion styles. That said, it's safe to say, George Clinton set out to orchestrate a movement that was beyond music. It was an aesthetic revolution that was built on the idea of free speech and what it meant to fully embody such an idea. The Parliament Funkadelic scene boldly embraced its wild approach to self-expression. Through the mediums of fashion, visual art, character design, storytelling, and music. Each working together, curating performances that exhibited outlandish, recurring characters and psychedelic concepts in science fiction plots. On the Funkadelic, the, you know, the show was such a huge part of their act. Um, you know, the costumes they came up with were just absolutely amazing. Oh, I think I hear the mother. 
ship coming. This intricate form of storytelling at times went as far as building a life-size spaceship for performances on stage and creating an expansive mythos of diverse characters rich in personality and self-expression. In parallel, Jet Set Radio Future holds its own sci-fi mythos as wild as any Parliament Funkadelic story. With its fair share of outlandish characters centered around communities that thrive and speak via musical and visual platforms. Welcome to the new Jet Set Radio! Hold up, hold up, hold up. Wait a minute. I think I'm gonna call it. Yeah, Jet Set Radio Future! I'm gonna have to go ahead and put on my philosophy dome a little bit deeper for this one. <laughs> If Jet Set Radio Future had a philosophy, I think the philosophy would be to stay authentic to yourself, no matter who disagrees or who doesn't like it. I think the philosophy would be, you are here now, you decide what the future is. If it hasn't been done before, you know, there's no reason you can't or shouldn't do it now. The philosophy behind it is kind of exploration, you know, ex exploring oneself at as much as what's happening in the environment around you. From a young age, that game taught me to be loud and bold. You know, um, if you're feeling it, rock that shit. Who cares? Just go for it. Be yourself. Be unique. I wish I had a beat button, but F what people think. <laughs> Literally, just forget about the haters. There's a lot of people going to judge you and not like you for who you are or what accomplishments you make. And that's what the game shows. The art we create and the stories we tell build a universal language. They hold the power to inspire others, to wake up the soul and serve reminders of the creative powers every individual holds. How has the Jet Set Radio series inspired me? Uh, it has 100% inspired my fashion choices. Literally without Jet Set Radio, sort of me seeing the traction that it was getting on Twitter, just even people just talking, you know, fondly about it inspired me of like, you know what, actually that sounds that sounds pretty dope to kind of tap back in and make some new scapegoat. I remember as well when I first started growing my dreads out, uh, I saw characters like DJ Professor K and Eddie Gordo from Tekken and I thought their hair looked fucking sick. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I kind of want to rock that style. That'd be fun. I'm just really in love with like the shading and the specific art style of the game. It's really inspired my art 1000%. I feel like it's my mission to talk about games like this and bring more light to them. I guess overall, just the creativity that you can just make something that didn't exist to me is still just like the coolest shit ever, you know? And I, I think that it's important to like not lose sight of, you know, trying to express yourself. I would say that if you are inspired by Jet Set Radio Future as a creator of music, art, whatever, whatever thing you're thinking of doing, absolutely go for it. I think the spirit of Jet Set Radio Future is like a bottomless well that we can all, you know, drink from. Why is it important for Sega to produce a port or remaster of Jet Set Radio Future? Uh, because the Steam version of Jet Set Radio from 10 years ago is only half the battle. Well, I know there's lots of, I wouldn't say conspiracy theories, but lots of theories of why uh, they never re-released the game because it's so popular and it has a huge cult following. Um, I don't know whether it was to do with music licensing. I imagine that could have been fixed very easily because an artist would normally license for a set period of time um, and then they could just re-license. I'm guessing it was to do with what the game teams were doing. To Sega, please 
please listen to the Jet Set Radio fans. We are really strong and really passionate about it. Playing older generation console games is much, much harder to do these days. And hopefully, you know, there are teenagers who love Jet Set Radio now. Hopefully there will be teenagers in 20 years still loving it because of whatever uh, resurgence happens. You think all you would have to do is make like a brightly colored game with modern music and a unique style. But there are brightly colored games with modern music and unique styles from the time that just don't hold up as well. Besides just us loyal fans, like new generations of people that play games these days deserve to have as much fun as we did grinding, skating, bopping to the funky beats. You know what I mean? Like we had so much fun with it and especially seeing how much it's, it's, it's inspired. It would be really cool to get people that are new fans on that train and then drum up hype for a return to Tokyo Toe. Jet Set Radio Future has touched and changed the lives of so many people across the world, inspiring and encouraging people to be themselves and to pursue their passions and dreams relentlessly. If there is one takeaway this game wants you to remember, love and self-expression are powerful tools that anyone can wield. Your voice is your own. It is up to you to decide how it will be used. The future is one big blank slate, yo! And it's up to you to decide what goes on in it. CD was made by Hideki Naganuma that he sent me when I was at Sega. So this is his tracks. I want everybody who watches this movie to know I don't have no tattoos, man. Maybe I should. You don't have a single tattoo, bro? Maybe I should get Just That Radio Future as my first tattoo, dude. And then this is the original CD that I burnt with my music from Just That Radio Future. All right, next question is going to be, how would you describe the Jet Set Radio Future fan base? Um, I could say three words, uh, passionate, impatient, and disappointed. I would describe them as very, very patient uh, and very, very desperate for uh, a sequel, a port, uh, or a really good spiritual sequel with Hideki Naganuma music just guiding us through the whole thing. I I would say that like, it's a fan base that's been super passionate over the years. There's been like so many fan driven projects uh, inspired by like the impact of the game. You know, a lot of of stuff comes and goes, you know, so to have a legacy that people still care about 20 years now or more, how many years has it been? 71 years? 74. 74 years. I know, dude. (laughs) <laughs> like, I can't even believe 74 years went by in what felt like 20 years. I remember, dude, when we made Alton, there was no electricity. I was still wearing that like colonial style of hair I was saying with the curls right there. Do you here. still have? Do you still have that hair anywhere? Dude, dude, yeah, because it was a wig. Yeah. <laughs>
Ryuta Ueda is a Japanese writer director best known for co creating the cult classic video game series Jet Set Radio. A series of games in which players choose a character they most identify with, skate on rollerblades, and tag graffiti across the surfaces of an oppressed city. Jet Set Radio and Jet Set Radio Future are games that, decade after decade, continue to be enjoyed by and inspire fans on an international scale. It is a testament to Ueda's game changing creativity, artistic direction, and his ability to connect with others through the power of storytelling. Join me for an enlightening conversation with Ryuta Ueda as we discuss his life and creative journey into making one of the most memorable video game series of all time. Nara, Japan. For over 1300 years, this city has steeped in rich history and vibrant culture. Sitting on the border of the Kyoto Prefecture, Nara was the capital of Japan from 710 to 794. While many still debate on the origins of its name, it is widely accepted as one of the most important cultural and historical sites in the country. It is a place where ancient traditions and modern aesthetics meet to create the city's unique and unrivaled voice. Ryuta Ueda grew up in Nara, a city that is home to many ancient temples and shrines. This exposure to such rich history and culture had a profound impact on Ueda's artistic development. Through experiencing Japan's ancient culture, I began contemplating deeply about what it means to be Japanese. Where does my identity lie in the realm of art and culture? Contemporary Japanese culture is a unique blend of Western and Eastern influences, creating a complex and distinct culture while taking pride in its historical Eastern culture. Japan has also excelled in assimilating new technologies and influences from the West refining them and creating something unique and different. This is particularly evident in anime and game culture. The worlds of games like Zelda and Elden Ring are not purely rooted in Eastern historical culture. Mario is Italian, and Sonic probably wouldn't exist without American cartoon animation. Even when we look at gaming consoles like the PlayStation and Nintendo, they were built upon the foundation laid by earlier consoles like Atari. This approach towards cultural fusion can be seen as both eclectic and adaptable. Ueda believes that perhaps this could be directly related to the mindset of Japanese Buddhist culture. From a Western perspective, especially from the United States, Many Americans are made to believe that our culture influences those across the world because they are lacking in something. This belief can be tied to the idea of cultural diffusion or the spread of cultural elements from one group to another. But in reality, especially with Japan's relationship with the US, what is taking place is more of a process of cultural fusion or the combination of two or more cultures to create a new cultural form. This can be seen in the transnational impacts of anime and manga influencing art styles and storytelling in the United States and comic books and filmmaking from the US influencing arts in Japan. Japanese culture is indeed a rich tapestry of influences and its ability to absorb and adapt from different sources is one of its defining characteristics. As Ueda stated previously, this is often due to Buddhist beliefs. This includes teachings like the three marks of existence, impermanence, suffering, and emptiness, or absence of self-nature. These three teachings are tied to a worldview and aesthetic that gravitates around the concept of beauty in things that are imperfect, impermanent, or incomplete in nature. 
This mindset and aesthetic is often referred to as Wabi Sabi, a phrase derived from two interrelated aesthetic concepts, Wabi and Sabi. According to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Wabi may be translated as subdued, austere beauty. Sabi means rustic patina. Characteristics of wabi-sabi aesthetics and principles include asymmetry, roughness, simplicity, economy, austerity, modesty, intimacy, and the appreciation of both natural objects and the forces of nature. Many of these aesthetics and principles are what Ryuta Ueda would later incorporate into his work. As a kid, exploration was always at the forefront of Ueda's mind, from climbing trees and rooftops to character design, imagining stories themed around interstellar exploration and roller skating. In the 1970s, there was a roller skating boom in Japan. I remember skating a lot with my sister and of course, getting injured from falling down. <laughs> I enjoyed drawing robots, monsters, and building Lego sets, particularly the space-themed ones. I think this early exposure to different forms of art, design, and exploration helped me develop my own unique style. Oedo was also influenced by a wide array of music and art, including rock, punk, reggae, ska, anime, and manga. Some of his biggest inspirations included visionary creatives like Go Nagai, creator of Devilman. Legendary and experimental filmmaker David Lynch. Story dictates everything and so once you fall in love and those pictures form and you stay true to those early feelings, true to the story, you go. It's the same as, as every film. Satoshi Kon, director of anime films like Perfect Blue. French filmmaker Jean Luc Godard. Qui soit juste, oui, mais enfin la critique n'est pas une la critique n'est pas une création artistique, ce sera toujours inférieur. Et les trois quarts des critiques, c'est un état de passage. C'est pour ça que les critiques sont toujours euh, amères et tristes vis-à-vis -vis de vis-à-vis -vis de ce qui même de ce qui loue, de ce qui décrit. Japanese artist Shinro Otake. Tadanori Yoku a prolific graphic designer. And Osamu Tezuka, the godfather of manga. I attended a very strict high school. I had many doubts about its system and uniform values. After that, I went to an art university where there were people with various values. It was there that I learned a lot about the importance of diversity. Ueda's interest in art and design led him to study at Kyoto City University of Arts, where he was exposed to a variety of different perspectives. This experience helped him to develop his own unique voice as an artist. I studied photography, video art, and installation art while I was still in school. I got involved in game production as a part-time job. I felt the future in the expression of video games. 
Shortly after graduating, Boeda joined Sega full-time. Unlike movies, video games make the player a resident within its world. It is an interactive experience, different from a one-sided form of storytelling. Being conscious of how players feel about their gaming experience is highly important and presents a challenge in creative endeavor. Mechanics that encourage users to gather metaphorical elements through their gameplay experiences without relying too heavily on words are indeed crucial elements. They foster a sense of deep engagement and curiosity, making the game experience more vivid and meaningful. Weta's first title for Sega was A Stall for the Sega Saturn, released in 1995. It was there that Weta was able to put his imagination to the test by producing character models. However, Weta's first major project at Sega was Jet Set Radio, a Dreamcast game released in 2000 that would go on to become an international cult classic. The game's unique style and approach to storytelling were a departure from the games that Ueda had worked on before, but he was able to successfully bring his vision to life with the help of an immensely talented team at his game studio, Smilebit. We faced challenges because the style and approach of the Jet Set radio games were different from the games we had worked on before. Our team consisted of young members in their 20s with little experience in such projects. However, each member was highly talented and had a great sense of creativity. Despite various difficulties, we were able to smoothly progress with the production, making it an enjoyable, creative process. Many of the members had an interest in street culture and that made it very easy for us to find consensus and work together. For Jet Set Radio, Weta would take on roles that involved art direction, world building, character design, narrative script writing, motion capture direction, audio direction, and voicing the character Potts, the dog. Although Ueda wrote the entirety of the Jet Set Radio stories on his own, he credits the success of the games to the creative collaborations of the team overall. It is important to value the awareness of working together in the process of creation and to communicate effectively, creating an awareness in everyone to strive for excellence. Along the way, his team faced several challenges, including the prolonged delay in obtaining project approval, the short development period, and locking down the art style. The shader provided by the development library was unable to achieve the style of expression we were seeking. It was necessary to have dedicated shaders prepared by an engineer. We had no prior experience with various things such as motion capture and voice recording. Ueda and his team would polish up on these skills over the process of developing Jet Set Radio, leading them to be much more well-versed when moving on to develop the second main game in the series. The shift in graphical style and visual aesthetic evolved tremendously from Jet Set Radio to Jet Set Radio Future as technology shifted from the Sega Dreamcast to Microsoft's original Xbox. Xbox, 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 Xbox. Emphasis of these technological advances can be seen in the cell shaded style, graffiti, architectural design, and of course, the character design in Jet Set Radio Future. When conceptualizing Jet Set Radio Future, we wanted to do something new. Of course, the advancement of hardware had also expanded the range of expressions that were possible. And you're 
ready to flow. It was important to include a first-person POV camera option for improved control and enhanced immersion. This theme of unity would echo across all areas of creative expression in the development of Jet Set Radio Future. One of the most prominent areas was Ueda's inspirations from contemporary culture from the 1960s to the 2000s, as well as his vision of the future during that time. We chose to blend artistic elements from those decades because we believed they represented the peak of street culture. I believe that music culture is born from the complex interplay of various cultural styles and influences from different eras. Japan, in particular, is a unique country where new and old Western and Eastern cultures blend together. The city of Tokyo is often seen as a symbol of such cultural fusion, representing a cosmopolitan atmosphere. We wanted to express that aspect through the visual style of Jet Set Radio Future. The goal for the visual style of Jet Set Radio Future was to express a sense of freshness and novelty while still maintaining a sense of continuity with the style of the previous game. Marvel Comics and DC Comics' concept of multiverses had a huge impact on Ueda's perception of storytelling. This inspiration helped him in reimagining the concepts of Jet Set Radio for development of Jet Set Radio Future. When reimagining characters like Professor K, we wanted to create a slightly unconventional image and incorporate a touch of futuristic style. If we mention the multiverse, it would be an appropriate description. Furthermore, Ueda discusses how music culture inspired his designs in the term Rudy's for the characters of Jet Set Radio Future. First of all, there's the music culture. It includes genres such as rock, punk, techno, and others that have a street vibe. Each of these genres has its own musical background. The term Rudy's was borrowed from the song Rudy Can't Fail by The Clash, the song Rude Boys Out of Jail by The Specials, and the concept of Rude Boys and reggae music. I believe that by providing players with a wide range of choices and play styles, players can find characters they can empathize with and feel a connection to, allowing them to immerse themselves more in the game. We also wanted to introduce diversity as a theme, and by offering diverse options, we aim to create a more inclusive and engaging gaming experience for players of all backgrounds. Throughout the story of JSRF, it becomes evident that the city you play in, Tokyo To, is under strict control, yet there continues to be a vibrant pushback for the freedom of self-expression from the citizens of the city. The oppressive atmosphere derives from a corporation owned by the fictional character Rikaku Goji, a man with an endless lust for control and praise. The citizens of Tokyoto live in a somewhat repressive society, yet they enjoy wearing free-spirited clothing and embracing the joy of living. Goji has acquired social power and wealth. Still, he becomes envious of people's freedom and various forms of self-expression and tries to make the streets his own. Ultimately, his attempts ended in failure. The Rokaku Group continues to endlessly remodel Tokyo. It is ironic in parallel to Tokyo, given that it is always filled with construction sites everywhere and it never becomes a fully completed city. There is a future for us. Here as we are, or somewhere else. JSRF's boss fights, though simple in combat, were full of sleek, mechanical, futuristic designs for bosses. Considering JSRF is set in a futuristic sci-fi setting, the boss fights were inspired by Japanese robot anime, aiming for grand and dynamic scenes, as well as emphasizing the interplay between street action. In an email interview with Yuichi Higuchi, lead artist of Jet Set Radio and Jet Set Radio Future, Higuchi states, It was 
my job to create the multi-legged boss mecha and the train type mecha, including design, modeling, and animation. We came up with the ideas based on heavy construction equipment and German train guns. Another interesting side note is about Captain Hayashi, the captain of the Rokaku police. In Jet Set Radio Future, it is Captain Hayashi who controls the mechas during the boss battles. There are also a few instances in which he is fought on foot. When asked why he incorporated Captain Hayashi, instead of bringing back Captain Onishima from the first game, Ueda states, Within the new world setting, I wanted to introduce more stoic characters that would be suitable for the story. However, upon reflection, it could have been possible to include Onishima. In addition to boss fights, Ueda was in charge of the motion capture for character dance moves, making dances in Jet Set Radio laid back, and those in Jet Set Radio Future more aggressive. When motion capturing, Mr. Ueda told the dancers about the concept and asked them to improvise various dances, which we used as the basis for the motion capture. If you know what I mean. <laughs> Higuchi was also the 3D artist who created the models for about half the player characters, designed by Ryuta Ueda. With Jet Set Radio Future, Ueda's studio, Smilebit, made an intentional leap toward developing an engaging open world for players to explore. In doing so, they believed the player would feel more present in the world around them. The base of inspiration is from the Tokyo of that time, but each area has different characteristics. We also imagined how it would evolve in the future. We drew from various sources of reference materials, but strived to unleash our imagination to the fullest to create a sense of being present in that fictional world. The city is made up of about 15 different locations, each varying drastically in atmosphere and style, acting as distinct characters in their own right. Majority of the levels were inspired by real world locations. Levels like Dogenzaka Hill and the Shibuya Terminal were inspired by Shibuya a ward in Tokyo, Japan, that remains to be one of the most popular and vibrant districts in the city, often known for fashion, shopping, and its bustling city nature. We included elements such as road signs, advertising, billboards, and public transportation that aligned with the setting. We added details like cars, graffiti, and weathered textures to enhance realism. Another level area named Chuo Street was inspired by Shinjuku, the most populous ward in Tokyo. With over 3.5 million residents, Shinjuku is a major commercial, business, and entertainment district. We made sure to include a diverse range of NPCs, non-player characters. Their presence, engaging in activities like walking, talking, shopping, and working, contributed to a sense of realism and liveliness. 99th Street was inspired by Kabukicho, a large entertainment district in Shinjuku. It is largely known for its countless bars, clubs, restaurants, shops, nightlife, and red light districts. Mm, this is 99th Street, the city's hottest nightlife scene, centering around Benton Tower. Here is just one bloody showdown after another, because it's where the mafia kingpins keep their offices. And there's been some bad stuff going down lately, ever since the mysterious power outage. Hmm. And Rapid 99 seems to have made this their home. All right, my people, it's time to give 99th Street a new paint job. In addition, 99th Street also takes inspiration from the streets of Hong Kong with its vivid neon lights and streets filled with lively pedestrians. This atmosphere, among many others, is complemented and enhanced through the careful use of sound design. We incorporated appropriate environmental sounds such as traffic, noise, voices, uh, music, and other ambient sounds. This helped to enhance the atmosphere and create a immersive experience. Other more residential levels like 
Kibogaoka Hill and Rakakudai Heights captured their visions of what the future of Tokyo's suburbs might be like in 2024. Over the last 11 years, the number of people in Japan has been shrinking instead of growing. And according to some estimates, Japan's population could be cut in half by the end of the century. Japan's estimated to have had fewer than 800,000 births last year. In the 1970s, that figure was more than 2 million. What does the data say? Population fell in all 47 prefectures of Japan in 2022. These settings house homes stacked on top of each other in favela-like atmospheres, while also showcasing settings that were once bustling, but now experiencing a decrease in population. Just the other day, the love shockers of Hikage Street were mixing it up with the noise tanks, new toadies, the immortals. Let's go do something about all that ugly immortal graffiti. Hikage Street is similar in atmosphere to the previous two levels mentioned. Though there is one major difference, Hikage Street seems to be an exclusive spot for couples. Throughout alleyways and various isolated areas, players can find couples together, some simply spending time together, others taking a stroll, and others using these isolated places for other activities. When Ueda was asked what the significance behind this was, he simply replied, <laughs> Please use your imagination. Music just turns me on. Ueda goes on to discuss how the level, the skyscraper district, and Pharaoh Park was conceived by imagining what an Egyptian theme park might be like in the center of the city's highest buildings. The roars of the ancient dragons still echo throughout the playgrounds of the heavens. Sky Dinosaurian Square. Dinosaurian Square embodies a full on theme park with roller coaster tracks for players to grind and perform tricks on. According to Ueda, the biggest inspiration for this level was the Korakuen Amusement Park from Japan's first full scale roller coaster, also known in Japan as Jet Coaster. One of the later levels in Jet Set Radio Future is that of the future site of Rokaku Expo Stadium. Ueda states that this environment was inspired by the Japan World Expo of 1970. Over 70 countries are participating. The Soviet Union has the tallest pavilion at 360 feet. Among the others are Canada, Italy, France, Australia, the Netherlands, etc., etc., etc. And what have Expo's millions of visitors come expecting to see? They've come for new experiences, for a glimpse of the future, a taste of other cultures, all under the Expo main theme of progress and harmony for mankind. This exposition brought in more than 64 million visitors from 77 countries. It was an event with a prominent theme of progress and harmony, or to put it simply, unity. It was an event where people could envision the future of the world together. Expo has been described sometimes by itself as the world of tomorrow. If this is what is to come, then many of the buildings are indeed futuristic. Although Jet Set Radio Future has a near-future, artistic, and slightly decadent atmosphere, I was conscious of pop culture and colorful styles. I know when to pay the front line, take the don'ts. Weta was also conscious of strategic placements of shapes throughout the world of the game. That same world is dominated by the Rikaku Group, a mega enterprise with a name that translates to Hexagonal. When asked about this, Weta says hexagons subtly placed throughout Tokyo To were done to symbolize the city being dominated by the Rikaku Group in all aspects of life. Place your bet. Concluding our conversation about the art style of Jet Set Radio, I asked Ueda if he was happy with the way it all turned out. 
Looking back now, I realize that there is room for improvement in my expressive abilities, but I'm satisfied with the efforts that I made at the time. It's natural to feel that there were aspects that could have been improved upon in terms of artistic expression, but I take pride in having given my best effort using the resources and skills I had at the time. Jet Set Radio! Whether you're chilling in your couch or in your coffin, don't forget to tune us in to keep you company! DJ Professor K takes inspiration from the blind DJ named Super Soul, who appears in the movie Vanishing Point. The 1971 American action film, directed by Richard C. Serafian. Vanishing Point focuses on a disaffected ex-policeman and a race driver named Kowalski delivering a muscle car cross-country to California while high on speed being chased by police and meeting various characters along the way. Super Soul is a blind African-American DJ who broadcasts from a pirate radio station in Goldfield, Nevada. He is a larger-than-life character who is both wise and irreverent. He provides a running commentary on the high-speed chase of Kowalski, the film's protagonist, and encourages him to keep going. Super Soul is a symbol of freedom and rebellion, and he represents the counterculture movement of the 1970s. According to the director, Super Soul is based on the real-life disc jockey, Jack Gibson. October the 5th, 1949, on a Monday morning. At 6 o'clock, I flipped the switch and said, Good morning, Atlanta. We are here. <laughs> <laughs> Often going by Jockey Jack or Jack the Rapper, Gibson was a pioneer in the news, music, and entertainment industries. Myself, I was a morning man, and I called myself the morning mayor of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And I made all the decisions what's going to happen in Atlanta today. That was my thing. So they said, uh, Jockey Jack, the morning mayor of Atlanta, proceeds and presides over the whole city. I said, good morning, Atlanta. What are we going to do today? And then I tell Atlanta what I want them to do. And I'd work from 6 to 9, I mean 6 to 8, and I'd come back again from 4 to 6. And what kind of music did you have the music segmented? In, in other words, at this time you would play jazz, at this no, no, time no, you no, played, no, you no, mixed no. it all up. Mixed everything. I was my own program director I see. and music director. I played what I thought I wanted to play at the time. Mm -hmm. Whatever hit me. Known as the father of black radio, Gibson pushed the boundaries through innovation, imagination, and fearlessness. Gibson created a path where there wasn't one previously and paved the way for everyone involved in black radio onward. This embracement of individuality and compassion for his community inspired the creation of Super Soul in the film Vanishing Point. The bold embodiment of Super Soul by Clavon Little created a memorable performance that left a lasting impact on Ueda. After watching Vanishing Point, Ueda not only found inspiration for DJ Professor K, but also for the film's themes of freedom, evading the police, and pirate radio. Aside from Vanishing Point, the Jet Set Radio series was also heavily inspired by a number of other films. According to Ueda, films like The Blues Brothers influenced Jet Set Radio through its themes of music, camaraderie, and like Vanishing Point, evading the police. Other films like Wild Style and The Warriors influenced Jet Set Radio's culture and attitude in the streets. Of course, it's street culture. It's also a fusion of inspiration from various sources. The name Jet Set came to mind while I was brainstorming for the game's title and happened to have the Sonic Youth album CD titled Experimental Jet Set Trash and No Star on my desk. I was inspired by the resonance of the words and the imagery of radio waves soaring through the sky during broadcasts. It seems that the name also carries the connotation of wealthy celebrities or socialites. The concept of pirate radio was inspired by the likes of Radio Caroline, a pirate radio station in the UK, and the Clash's song, This Is Radio Clash. Citizen Kane, 
influenced Rikaku Goji's setting. Similar to the story of Citizen Kane, Goji has succeeded at becoming a millionaire, yet he still feels loneliness and disconnectedness. He has been eager to possess something, but it's what the Rudys already have. The 1985 film Brazil influences the game's unique world settings and themes of propaganda, authoritarianism, and manipulation of media. Upon writing the script for Jet Set Radio Future's story, Ueda made sure to put the most important ideas at the forefront. These ideas included individuality and self-expression, unity and friendship, resistance against authority. Although Jet Set Radio and Jet Set Radio Future differ in style and story, their core themes remain the same. Both games feature rebellious characters as protagonists who express themselves through graffiti art and confront oppressive forces. Themes of unity, friendship, uh, self-expression, and counterculture remain consistent and play important roles in both games. Even if the specific circumstances and storylines differ, the core character traits remain intact, providing a sense of continuity and familiarity across Jet Set Radio and Jet Set Radio Future. During this interview with Ryuta Ueda, there was a common theme in his responses. He expressed the importance of allowing things to speak for themselves. I believe it's important not to over-explain. I prioritize what users could feel from the visuals, sounds, and actions within the experience. This approach is one that has not changed since the creation of Jet Set Radio. By incorporating the presence of DJ Professor K as a commentator, the player character was prevented from speaking excessively in an explanatory manner. The goal here seemed to be to leave the perception of the story up to the player's own unique experience, rather than having a main character speak for everyone, locking in a singular experience. While there are differences in terms of the futuristic setting, the JSRF has a slightly more mature atmosphere compared to JSR. The game's art direction, storytelling, and character development may contribute to this sense of maturity. There's a possibility that they also contribute to the more mature atmosphere. While themes such as rebellion, self-expression, and counterculture still resonate, they are portrayed in a way that reflects a more adult perspective. The themes of rebellion, self-expression, and culture are shared by both JSRF and JSR. However, JSRF places a greater emphasis on the themes of unity and friendship. The characters in Jet Set Radio Future maintain their individuality while coming together in unity, supporting each other, and resisting the oppressive rule of the Rokaku group. The game delves deeper into the theme of oppressive regimes and the control exerted by powerful corporations. When reflecting upon Jet Set Radio Future's themes of individuality, self-expression, diversity, youth culture, counterculture, and resistance against societal constraints and authority, Boyda expressed, It is important to think about what values cannot be changed by money and to act in alignment with them. When asked about what he learned from the experience of working on these games, Ueda responds humbly, stating, If approached with sincerity, it becomes something memorable. Throughout my research and documentation of the development of the Jet Set Radio games, one question always returns. Why has there never been a re-release of Jet Set Radio Future? If there was one person I wanted to ask, it was Ryuta Ueda. The question of why Sega has never re-released Jet Set Radio Future in any form is just as much of a mystery to Mr. Ueda as it is to the Jet Set Radio fans. His personal opinion is that he hopes to see a re-release of it someday soon. JSRF takes place in a fictional setting, so there are significant differences from the actual real world. 
However, I feel the, the challenges and issues in the world have not changed much. Aspects such as human relationships, societal conflicts, and themes of anti-establishment exist as common elements, regardless of the era or setting. Although he wishes he had taken more time to relax a bit during the development process of the Jet Set Radio games, Ryuta Ueda remains proud of his team's hard work and the immense impact and expansive influence the series has had on other indie games and creatives of all types. When asked what advice or tips he might give to other artists or storytellers, Ueda says, Don't let others sway you. Believe in yourself and value your ideas and individuality. Always have the courage to challenge yourself with new things. Through Ryuta Ueda's own personal journey of challenging himself to try new things, he created iconic characters and memorable stories that have inspired others across the globe for decades. Without a doubt, Jet Set Radio and Jet Set Radio Future will continue to inspire others to push the boundaries of creativity, embrace individuality, and to spread the awareness of the importance of unity. I believe that Jet Set Radio continues to be loved because of the continuous support and passion of the fans. I am truly grateful for it. I am both surprised and delighted to see that even those who have recently discovered the game are showing interest. I'm sure that characters like DJ Professor K and Beat would also be happy about it. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I believe that Jet Set Radio will continue to broadcast in your hearts forever. and identify the beats. Sega released a game-changing title for the Dreamcast. Jet Set Radio! Oh wait, hold on. Jet Set Radio! Two years later, Sega would release another installment in the series. Jet Set Radio Future! Tune into the new revolution! Ready to 15 new and only on Xbox. If you'd like to learn more about the history of these games, be sure to check out my documentary feature, Masterpieces Jet Set Radio Future. As of the making of this, it has been 21 years since a new installment has been developed for the mainline series. To put that into perspective, Jet Set Radio Future, at the time of its release in 2002, aimed to depict a futuristic Tokyo set in the year 2024. That is now less than a year away. Over the decades, the Jet Set Radio games have developed a cult following of passionate fans that have tried everything to get Sega's attention to make a third Jet Set Radio game. Some of those fans were game developers who took matters into their own hands and conceptualized potential sequels. What's up everybody, False Proof here. 
the godfather of Jet Set Radio content. And trust me, I got receipts on that. Kay's got the receipts because Kay's the one who said it. So, I mean, it must be true if somebody else says it, right? Anyway, today we're here to talk about some Jet Set Radio leaks, rumors, proposed projects, all the fun times we could have gotten a third Jet Set Radio game and we didn't. To play. It's another late night for gamers as they wait to try out the latest game system. The Nintendo Wii goes on sale at midnight. In 2006, Kuju Entertainment came up with a proposal for a new Jet Set Radio game on the Nintendo Wii and pitched it to Sega. Prior to their pitch, the near 100 person powered studio had developed games like Battalion Wars for GameCube and Call of Duty Finest Hour for GameCube, PS2, and Xbox. Jet Set Radio for the Wii could have offered the most immersive experience yet with motion controls guiding skating tricks and graffiti tagging and the speaker of the Wiimote being utilized for DJ Professor K to speak directly to the player during gameplay. The traditional controller is replaced by a device that allows players to be involved in the game like never before. Is this footage going to come back to haunt us or what? It is already haunting us. <laughs> you know, you'd use the Wiimote as a graffiti spray can, you'd shake it, you'd probably have to shake it in order for it to work. I feel like that would have been incredibly troublesome and I probably would have loved it. Other Sega titles when they kind of went to the Wii, they didn't really perform as well, both on the console itself in terms of gameplay, but also in terms of sales. There's been several revivals that have just fallen flat from Sega in this era. 2006 famously gave us Sonic the Hedgehog 2006. There's a bomb in that There was also Super Monkey Ball Adventure around this time. So as you can see, they were trying these kind of Wii PS2 downgrades for popular franchises and they were not doing too well so with that in mind maybe we dodged a bullet here i feel like jet set radio could have done something fun with maybe like the graffiti can you know spraying those giant murals you could do something with the wiimote in that sort of motion kind of following the arrows as you would in the first game that could be kind of cool like i mean outside of that this would have just kind of been you know a normal action platformer that kind of got held back by the control scheme of the wii with this new style of gameplay came new styles of gangs as well check the mic and make sure it sound right boys concept art from corey ray lewis showcases designs of reimagined characters like beat gum Tab, and DJ Professor K that would have been used for Kuju Entertainment's We Imagining of Jet Set Radio. I think that Jet Set Radio Wii has a really interesting thing going on. It's playful, it's loud, it's fun, it's colorful, but it's obviously a little different from the usual Jet Set Radio style. There's a clear intention here to appeal to a slightly younger audience than the previous games. Since this is the Wii, and there were plenty of games doing something similar around that time. I love the art concept. Beat looks great, gum looks great. There was even some new characters that were kind of different. I really love the outfit changes and the tweaks that they make to the character design. It looked kind of rustic and it had some rough edges to it, like Gum's pants is kind of like torn at the bottom and uh, Beat's bandana has like little hairs at the end. It's a very interesting balance between cool, edgy, goofy, and cute. Looking at the art style, I really enjoyed these concept sketches. Concept art of items and gangs depicted manga-esque designs that captured the essence of Jet Set Radio's funky spirit. To be quite honest, it still feels like fan art. It doesn't feel like something that you would truly see from a third game in the series from the uh, franchise creators. New characters like Swivel, Nozzle, Ninja, and new gangs like the Squabble Hawks could have instilled new life into the series. I think Swivel, Nozzle, Ninja looks really freaking dope. 
uh, it kind of sucks that we'll never see like this character in their full form. There's obviously like the ninja aspect to it and how does that work out with rollerblading and graffiti? Like where is, does the story tie in there? I'm very curious. Swivel nozzle ninja. I understand what he's about off rip. I think that dude's sick. I want to try skating with a sword now. Um, the game doesn't exist. There's no disclaimer saying I can't. So I might just try that. I feel like the Swivel Nozzle Ninjas probably would be coming from maybe a town with a um, ancient castle. Those sandal skates that he has? Freaking fire, dude. I want a pair of those. The only thing about him is like the mask looks a little Immortals derivative. He'd look really cool with like an Oni Samurai mask or something with like the big teeth. I think that'd look fire. Funny thing, I actually didn't know about Swivel Nozzle Ninja until I actually saw this document. Definitely gives me the vibe that they would either be associated or uh, feuding with the Immortals, kind of have that like bit of an undead look if you kind of view the face and the eyes. Obviously Hawks from My Hero Academia is super huge, so I feel like they might have had a missed opportunity there by not having a game that includes this character. It's nice to see some new additions, but at the same time, it was a little questionable, like, hmm. It still captures the Jet Set Radio essence, which I love and adore. The design's definitely interesting, and obviously the Squabble Hawks are, you know, very animal-based. Definitely probably would be rivals of Poison Jam. But I mean, I would love, I would have loved to see those two gangs kind of run it back, you know, figure out who is really owning the territory of Tokyo Toe. Squabble Hawks and Swivel Nozzle Ninja, they sound like villain names that would be in a Jet Set Radio game. They did a very good job of creating new characters, but still keeping it accurate to what the game represents and feels like. It's still punchy, it's still edgy, just with a bit more of a bright and poppy, youthful look. The characters all have really interesting, jagged, zigzaggy qualities to their line art that I think helps bring in some of that Jet Set Radio edge. Upon rumors of this pitch spreading around the net, it was also rumored that Sega rejected the project due to conflicts with then-current plans for a new installment in the Jet Set Radio series. Of course, now we know those plans never came to fruition. Regardless, fans have tried to drum up hype for a new game ever since. Fast forward 11 years, a new game studio would try their hand at pitching their own imaginative take on the Jet Set Radio series. My name is Jesse Sosa. I work over at uh, Gearbox Software, working on games such as Borderlands and Wonderlands. Uh, my personal uh, studio, Dinosaur Entertainment, has been around since 2011. Started off as kind of a side project with me and one of my best friends. We were looking for a way to work on other projects on the side for fun, to make our own little games and stuff like that. In 2014, I went to Brazil to start a studio down there. We were working on mobile games and we were pushing the mobile hardware at the time to its limits. We had some dead time between projects and in the back of my mind, I was like, I have an idea. I've always wanted to prove this out. And it was basically an offshoot of Jet Set Radio. I started a project called Project Halftone, which the closest I can describe it was Spider-Verse stuff. You know, halftone patterns, sketch patterns, you know, outlines that were crazy and stuff like that. At the studio, we, we got pretty far. We had this whole, this whole idea of teenage youth, teenage rebellion, you know, against corporations and, and the man, right? And we were wondering what a future would look like in where everything was ruled by a very clean aesthetic, something that's very iPhone-like, very Apple-like. I wanted to contrast that heavily with 70s and 80s punk. So we started working on this project just to kind of keep the artist going and, and to, to push the limits of this phone. And we got pretty far on the whole thing. And then there were some creative differences at the studio. Creative director had to stop working on that and started working on something else. So we decided to kind of go rogue. And then we were like, well, what do we do next? I'm like, well, let's just work on Project Halftone, but let's change it. And they were like, what do you have in mind? I'm like, 
Stu jets at radio. This resulted in their creative idea to tweak the work they had completed to fit a new vision, a vision that took Jet Set Radio Future's spirit to heart as they reimagined a new remixed version of Jet Set Radio. What is your relationship with Jet Set Radio? Oh, my relationship with Jet Set Radio is, runs pretty deep. When I first played it, I didn't know games could look like that. As an artist, uh, you know, visuals are very important to me. As an art director, I'm always out looking for interesting visual styles. Developing a game is much more than, than just simply having a gameplay idea. And gameplay to me is probably the most important thing, but if you're not thinking about the music, if you're not thinking about the visuals, you know, the gameplay, everything all together at once to build it up together, it's just it's just not gonna work. Not like this. Jet Set Radio Future, that became my favorite version of Jet Set Radio. It's rare that you can take a game and then have such an impression on the art world in general and then make a sequel to it and have that same exact impression. Ever since then, I've been chasing that same high. With, with every uh, new console generation, you get all these extra CPU cycles. It's like, well, what can we do with it? And unfortunately, in our industry, everyone's just like, well, just make it look more real. I find more fun and infinitely more challenge in what would this look like? as a painting by Van Gogh, right? And how can we do that in real time? Th this has been sitting in the back of my head for so long that I knew immediately what I was gonna do with gum. I just sketched her out real fast. Like it's it's literally a garbage napkin sketch. At the time, Jet Set Radio, their characters and stuff were influenced by graffiti art. And so everything was chunky and big and very bottom heavy with big, big old Jinko jeans, you know, like that was that were real popular at the turn of the century. That stuff wasn't necessarily popular anymore. I was taking inspiration from from some of the, the real popular sculptors in Japan that were putting out these statues. And there was one specifically of Yoko from Gurren Lagann. The, the proportions there and along with other statues that were coming out at the time were very inspiring to me. It was it was almost kind of like it was like anime, but it was it was still it was just a little bit more grown up, if you will, like it was a little bit more mature in terms of like the proportions and the styles and the way things were being presented. That basically led the entire design. Before I knew it, we had gum and we had beat. The, the beat just followed organically right after gum. Uh, he's the face of, you know, Jet Set Radio Future. I, I accomplished my initial goal, which is just to see the shader. Uh, and these characters. And then I had another goal of like, well, what, what would a city look like later, you know? And so I got with one of my friends, Doug, uh, who's an environment artist. And I was like, hey man, can you help me build like some of the city? And he was like, sure. And so he put together this, the the city that's in our little demo. Just a, It's just like a block of, of, of the Shibuya 109 intersection there. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna model some cars in this too. So I, I started modeling some cars in, in the same style that, that I was thinking for, for Jet Set Radio Evolution. That was a lot of fun. And so I was like, cool, we, we got GDC coming up, so maybe I can get some art contracts with this. The 2017 Game Developers Conference was packed with ripe indie game studios looking for potential work with major publishers. And people were going in person to kind of, you know, mingle and network with the games industry. One of those studios was Dinosaur Games. Their concept art for Jet Set Radio Evolution caught Sony's eye, and Sony followed up with a request to see the concept art in motion. In the coming week, they spent countless hours bringing that vision to life. Put it all together, we had to learn all the cinematic tools and everything. We, he also asked for some business plans and stuff like that, so I just you know, extrapolated the whole, the whole idea, right? And we sent it off when it was done. Loved it, but uh, ultimately, you know, the, the visions just didn't line up with, with Sega and their plans. Even though their passionate hard work astonished the Atlas division of Sony, it wasn't enough. The new vision for a futuristic jet set radio was turned down without a reason being provided. Sega and Sony haven't had as much of a, I guess, close-knit relationship as, say, maybe Sega and Nintendo when they finally moved away from doing hardware and started putting more of the Sonic games on the Nintendo stuff. Or even, you know, Sega and Microsoft when they had that really close relationship for the launch of the Xbox. So this was kind of interesting that per we could have perhaps maybe have had something from Sega that would have may or may not have been exclusively on at PlayStation. There are a lot of differences between technology, fashion, music, uh, character design, and even aggressive inline skating between like 2002 and 2017. Jet Set Radio Evo shows how those differences 
didn't just disappear. Those trends didn't just go away. They transformed. The environment looks amazing. I think it's perfect. It's, it's very colorful and it's very vibrant, but it's not in your face and it's not overwhelming. Instead of black outlines, it's going with like colored outlines. The uh, environments themselves feel a lot more like you're in the matrix. They took a lot of what Jet Set Radio was already doing with experimenting with shapes and color, and they just amped it up even further. The colors in this art style are balanced very well. The art looks so pretty. It looks like what you see now in video games, especially in the indie game genre, with like the vivid colors, it pops out. They, they stick to what they want to stick to, like details, all about the details. I think everyone agrees it looks pretty sleek. Again, the, the style feels very inspired by the original while taking it into its own new direction. The fact that it's so contrasted with that neon green and the really darker tones in the background, it feels a lot like some of the levels in Jet Set Radio Future, especially as you get further into the game. You know, the Highway Zero, the uh, Pharaoh Park, uh, the outline is all right. I don't mind that too much, but maybe just having the entire game be like this giant like blast of neon-esque environments might have been a little bit much. But that's the sort of thing a proof of concept doesn't need to worry about that gets ironed out in gameplay. I really wish evolution would actually like happened because like I remember seeing that online and being like, whoa, like how cool would this be if this actually came through? The character designs look really cool. I like the new redesigns for Beat and Gum and Rowboy. And of course we were pressed for time with a lot of this stuff. So I was like, I don't know, do a robot, I guess, like something quick and easy. And then I, I started thinking about it and I was like, what about Rowboy? I'm like, where did they get Rowboy from? And so I started visualizing the story in my head where maybe maybe Rokoku, no Rokaku, I guess, right? Maybe they were doing some experiments, right? They were trying to push the whole law enforcement thing and, and maybe, you know, the next step is autonomous drone. Maybe maybe that's the direction they're going. And and I could imagine the GGs at some point ran across a discarded body or or maybe they broke into a thing and, and, and found this this robot. And they were like, oh, you know what? We can we can do something with this. And they took it and they reprogrammed it. And now it's just kind of like their, you know, their buddy. And I was like looking for something simple to model anyways. And I was like, well, this, this makes sense. And so that's what I did. I just started modeling Roboy, but I was like, what did Roboy look like before he got taken by the GGs, right? And so I was like, okay, so this is like a step up, right? Uh, the, an evolution of their, their enemy design. There, there was all kinds of like doodads and stuff that I, I had that, that we didn't get to see, but you know, he's, he's gonna have like sonic weapons and things like that, but we just never got to that point. But you know, his arms are gonna be able to stretch out long to be able to hit you from a distance. So you have to, you're forced to go in there close, you know, just just typical boss design, but that, that never was made, but that was all up in, in the brain. Yeah, when I was looking at those designs, I was looking at his arms and I was like, I bet those would stretch out at some point. These redesigns for beet and gum especially are just chef's kiss. They're like smoothed out, contoured, 3D model, reactive lighting based characters. The colors and the waveform effect on Beat's goggles. I can practically hear the soundtrack just like looking at those goggles. We have the shader all set up so when he's talking, you know, and the music's playing, it would be bouncing. And the, right now we just have a generic heartbeat, but that heartbeat was supposed to be kind of like a spectrogram. The horizontal hatching line used for shading all over the clothing is a super interesting and unique effect. I've never seen it before. And it gives the impression of like a textured surface with like detail going on. And I was messing with the values in the shader and I accidentally hit the wrong value and it took the, the halftone dots and stretched them out. And it stretched them all out horizontally on them. And, and I, I looked at that and I was like, scan lines, hell yeah. You can see the scan lines here um, for that shading kind of like, again, like I said, like pushing pushing a little bit more towards the sci-fi just felt right. We gave them all communicators on their wrists. So the beat and gum have, have a communicator there that, you know, they can like call into or whatever to, to talk with people. Uh, because beat has always come across to me as kind of like a laid back character. Like he's kind of into his own thing, especially in future with stuff. So I was just like, screw it. I'll give him big ass exhaust pipes. I don't know. We can do some cool stuff with that. They went from like oversized razor skates that were kind of blocky to these like buckled and strapped up. You've got your Aeons, you've got USDs. Like the, the way they look has transformed. Visually, 
I think this game could have been the perfect Jet Set Radio 3, honestly. They managed to capture a more realistic look while losing none of that like loud, iconic, punk rock spirit and energy from the original. What was going to be different about these new Jet Set Radio games that we didn't see in Jet Set Radio or Jet Set Radio Future? Jet Set Radio Evolution was so much more than just concept art. What Dinosaur Games had come up with was a game design document that included an outline for a budget, game mechanics, environments, and story. The story of Jet Set Radio Evolution, at least the in-game story, I, I wasn't going to mess with a good thing. It's uh, the same type of story, you know, you got the GGs, you know, they rule Tokyo Toe and all that stuff. And, you know, it's just the rise of a new puppet master, right? He comes up and he's controlling the Rokoku group. And now they got to reassert their dominance. Evolution's always been in the back of the head, which is why we call it Jet Set Radio Evolution. It's always like, what aspects of the game can we evolve? One of the things that I that always frustrated me about Jet Set Radio was their combat system. Their combat system was uh, boiled down to spray canning stuff. And that's fine, but it always let me down whenever I was fighting bosses and the bosses essentially turned into a, a chase mode and then you had to spray paint them. And I would get really frustrated just chasing them because all I could do is just spray paint. I, as frustrated as I was, I couldn't punch them, right? And that's what I wanted to do. I, I understand like there's there's a general vibe about Jet Set Radio. It's not about the violence, it's, it's none of that. But there's a way to create a combat system that is not overtly violent. So I've always had this idea in my head, again, along with the art style, I just had this, this combat idea. The combat system was all designed around music. So my idea was to lock down the beats per minute for the soundtrack, faster or slower, depending on the, on the tone, but it's always gonna be kind of like the same kind of like beat. We were wanting to develop a combat system that was based around skating tricks. So as you're skating, right, I want to take advantage of the outlines that the characters have. So when you get close to someone that you're ready to attack, their outline would start jittering or your your player character would start jittering and you can kind of see theirs kind of jitter so you can see who's targeting who. Uh, similar to Batman Arkham Asylum, you have one button which is contextual. In Jet Set Radio, I would want it to be the trick button. So as you're grinding, you hit this button and you're doing tricks. You're going to, you know, gain speed and all that stuff. The difference is that w when you're close to someone, you hit that button, instead of doing a trick, you'll kind of like maybe I don't know, you'll do like a like a spin with your leg out and then you'll you'll hit them, right? But you'll jump in their general direction, right? And it's kind of like Batman Arkham Asylum where you're kind of like leaping towards your selected target, which will uh, allow you to chain attacks very easily. So when you, when you have like a Rokoku cops all around you, you know, instead of just going like randomly and hoping that you hit them, you can actually be doing tricks and they'll be dancing, break dancing, doing this and that, but but they'll hit, 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 and, and you'll be skating towards enemies and it, it's just kind of like magneting you towards yeah. enemies. And I'm like, that sounds like fun. That, that sounds that amazing. feels right. Yeah. Yeah, that feels right. You know, you would hit the buttons on the beat for additional multipliers and things like that. Yeah. So, you know, you get random, random chances of knocking people out, unconscious, whatever it is, but it doesn't penalize you if you're not good at hitting the beat. It's gotcha. just there to guide you. So everything in the music mattered. We don't know if they're going to do anything like this with a third game. But Dinosaur Games has kind of talked about maybe doing something similar. Now they talked about this like five years ago after they did the pitch. They said they were going to rework some things, maybe come out with something a little bit different. We don't know. But we'll, we'll have to just wait and see. But that seems to be the thing with this series a lot of the time. You wait and see and wait and see and... Here we go now. Since 2018, Dinosaur Games has kept their work on the down low, but fortunately, while speaking to Jesse for this documentary, I was able to get a sneak peek for their upcoming untitled project, inspired by their work on Jet Set Radio Evolution. A year after Jesse worked on Jet Set Radio Evolution, he created more Jet Set Radio concept art for something else. Information about this project remains confidential. 
However, what I can do is read you what he wrote upon sharing his concepts on ArtStation. I made these two models in less than a week in early 2017. Let the speculation begin over what these were created for. These concepts showcase the array of talent, skill, and undying passion at Dinosaur Games. Come 2021, a new wave of hype for Jet Set Radio 3 would emerge. According to leaks found on Reddit and Twitter, here's the timeline. 2021, Sega holds an internal meeting to showcase works in development. 2022, rumors of Sega reviving old intellectual properties in the style of Fortnite with microtransactions begin to spread. In April of 2022, Bloomberg reported that Sega was working on a new Jet Set Radio and Crazy Taxi game. From what we were told from some inside sources, as of July 2022, Sega was still moving ahead and they shifted focus from Crazy Taxi to Jet Set Radio. And the goal was to nail down the art style and the gameplay focus and that they were focusing on just about every aspect of the first two games. Everything was on the table, they were open to anything. And they were really trying to gauge what the best balance was for players. So if you prefer the open world of Jet Set Radio Future, but you like the graffiti technique of the original Jet Set Radio, and surveys showed that that was what fans wanted, then that's what Sega was going to deliver. A survey is put out to examine the reception of various potential art styles for a new Jet Set Radio game. What I found so fun and unique about Jet Set Radio is that it was, it was made by a small team who didn't take very many notes from the higher ups. They kind of just made what they wanted to make and it was a success. And then to see something like this, that is a third Jet Set Radio, but being, I guess, crowdsourced for something like an art style is so bizarre to me. Someone actually posted the concept art, the one that you see in the leak on the Jet Set Radio subreddit. And people were originally kind of thinking like, oh, this is fan art, like it looks really weird. I don't really like this new look. I don't think it fits Jet Set Radio. And then as soon as people thought that this could be a possibility. They were just going absolutely nuts trying to find this leak. I don't think the concept art was intentionally leaked because of the way that it was leaked to me. This stuff was shown to people in the know, in the community, some people who are writers for fan sites, some people who are journalists, some people who are just very vocal fans online. They sign an NDA and then they can't like close the window or take screen caps or whatever. So they take photos of their screen. I was contacted directly from the guy who leaked it. They were sending me links to their tweet. And then I think they realized that there was a, a specific number on there. So they deleted it, but people had already downloaded and saved it. So. Some people got their hands on it. That's why I blur it because I don't want to be the source. I don't want Saga to say, hey, we saw Barry's video and we read the number and now we're suing you. Not me, but him. <laughs> I don't want to be an accomplice. But I don't want the leaks. I, I kind of want to be surprised. I feel like as much as we want a new Jet Set Radio Future game, it just doesn't make sense to like, like leak something that might be super dope if we didn't know what it was. There's a lot of controversy about these. Since it's a leak, maybe the lighting's a little off, you know, and it is concept as well. We've got four variations on this piece of concept art. One, a version with flat cell shading, but realistic folds and shadow placement. Two is a version with flat cell shading and more simplified anime style shadows and features. And three is a version that seems to combine cell shading and more realistic rendering on top of each other as well as some more realistic like body proportions and facial features and then four is a version with heavy emphasis on bold dark outlines and detailed shading out of these four number two is the one that best suits jet set radio and best matches the original games so i'm very glad that the later leak seems to imply that this was probably the route they've gone forward with it seems like they're just kind of reviving Jet Set Radio using elements of one and two a little bit and then pushing it much more realistically. 
I, I'm intrigued by the concept art, and I'm actually not put off by it like I was with uh, past external efforts. What I always say about a Jet Set Radio 3, like, you need to have a reason to make it, and you need to have something special to have it stand out, especially when Jet Set Radio and Jet Set Radio Future were so different from each other. W what else can they do with it? That's what I want to see. 2023, a video from the 2021 Sega internal meeting surfaces online. Now, let's break it down. The meeting held in 2021 was allegedly done so to showcase upcoming games Sega had in development. Based on the leaked video in 2023, if it's real, it can be discerned that the video was used to highlight a remake of Persona 3, Sonic Frontiers DLC, and a new Jet Set Radio game. And the reason why people think this one's going to happen is because the two other things that were included in this leak actually wound up being a reality. When the leaked video from April 2023 is examined in detail, we can see that many elements of its makeup match the concept art that was featured in the 2022 leaked survey. The main character, Beat, dances in retro-inspired attire with a modern twist. A high-collared baggy golden jacket with lettering on the front is paired with gunmetal gray pants, large headphones, the classic alien-eyed goggles or sunglasses, and skates that seem to be inspired by shoes and footwear. Two modern neon green wheels are mounted on the bottom of each skate, separated by a metal bar for grinding. If we slow down the video and take a closer look, it can also be seen that a jet function was also incorporated into the design, as there appears to be some kind of propulsion exhaust pipe on the back of each skate. The colors of the skates are red, gold, and white, matching the rest of Beat's outfit. I like the joggers, I like the uh, sort of J-pop style that he has going on. It's kind of a merge between Jet Set Radio and almost Persona-ish, at least. Looking at the background, like I can definitely see that being like the Shibuya area that you kind of explored in Persona a little bit. And I'd be curious as to just like how big that environment is. I would like to see something a bit different. This is probably just placeholder for development. Some people think this might be part of the super game. Some people think this is a reboot. Some people think this is a whole new game. They need to nail the art style and they need to have this game be a success from out of the gate. So I can see why they're so hyper-focused on the look because the look is what's gonna sell it. And I also did find it odd that they just used the uh, Jet Set Radio logo from the first game really big a couple times rather than giving us any indication of like a new game. What's interesting is when compared to the concept art, there are a few noticeable differences. The first is the lettering on Beat's jacket. The lettering is simply outlined in the video, whereas in the concept art, it is filled in with orange. Another difference is the headphones appear to look darker in color in the concept art, but in the video, take on a more silver-colored appearance. In the leaked video from April 2023, the only character we see is Beat. Keep in mind, if this video is real, it is originally from 2021. But in the leaked concept art from 2022, two other characters are present, Gum and Combo. These names are not official, and if these leaks are real, are subject to change. For this, I will be referring to them with those names, as they best represent those characters from previous games. When we take a look at the leaked concept art from 2022, we can see that Combo is dressed in baggy hip-hop attire that feels very 90s Japan, with everything from his checkered sleeves to his popped up red collar, gold chain, and purple hat. Uh, combo with his checkerboard sleeves really stands out. And of course he has the giant yen necklace, but it's not so uh, hilariously large as it used to be. I appreciated that Combo was in the concept sketch, still just kind of a door of a man, which he has to be. It's what makes him super cool. Meanwhile, Gum is dressed in a lime green hat or beanie with a crop top, gloves, short shorts, and thigh-high stockings to match. Her little helmet is really goofy, but in a good way. It gives me both uh, Jet Set Radio and Jet Set Radio Future vibes. 
One thing that is interesting about her design is her skates, as they seem to match Beats skates, similar in color across the sneaker portion of the skate, but with gray wheels instead of green. The skates are largely all the same, especially when characters were kind of known for their unique skates. It could be just kind of a time-saving situation where they probably wanted to rush out this concept art and not focus on designing the character's skates so much. Their skates do not look like aggressive inline skates anymore. If they're going for a time period that matches this, then I think that works. But if they were trying to make it like the original, then I think it doesn't work. I actually really like the look of gum. I really like the look of combo. It still looks like the characters we know very well. The fashions that the characters are wearing, definitely they match the color schemes and the look of the original game more. And just the surrounding environment, it looks very much so to be inspired by something you would see every day rather than something that's looking towards the future. Jet Set Radio Future is kind of already a depiction of the future of the original Jet Set Radio. So I think this is like a different future of the first Jet Set Radio. Jet Set Radio has kind of a better launching pad or foundation to kind of build uh, upon having a more realistic look in terms of like street fashion rather than that sort of neo-futuristic early 2000s look of Jet Set Radio Future. One's a little more dated than the other, and that's, that's kind of hard for me to say because I really like Jet Set Radio Future. It feels a little bit too real to me. Like everything about what Jet Set Radio embodies is very unreal and unrealistic. I personally prefer the older look. I love how rugged and choppy and blocky everything looks. Given the possible timeline of these leaks, it would seem that the concept art that was leaked was developed or updated after the video was showcased at the 2021 Sega meeting. In order to theorize where the Jet Set Radio series could be headed and what Jet Set Radio 3 might be like, we first need to take into account the facts. In terms of sales, Jet Set Radio performed significantly better than Jet Set Radio Future and Sega tends to cling to the first Jet Set Radio game when releasing new merch or having cameos in other Sega games. All that said, it's time to theorize. With these facts in mind, what do you theorize Sega could have in store for the future of Jet Set Radio? It's probably gonna feature like uh, character showcases in other video games to try to warm the public back up, get the people familiar with the franchise again, and then create content. I don't know if there will be another game after that. I hope so, but we'll see. There was already a Jet Set Radio HD, so I think it could be possible that they would do a remaster of it. If they were to remake the original Jet Set Radio, they'd have to undergo some pretty serious changes. The structure of the game itself can be a little archaic in some ways, and I'd imagine new players jumping in right now might have a lot of trouble figuring out what exactly they need to do to progress. If they incorporated some new mechanics, it would only make that game a lot better. I would be baffled in a good way if we saw a remake or a continuation of the Jet Set series in any way from Sega. I'm sure that the individuals who worked on it, you know, Funky Uncle in particular, I'm sure they would be down and they still seem to have a lot of encouragement for these games and a lot of fondness for them, but the, the CEOs are the ones that decide what happens in a lot of those circumstances, so I unfortunately don't feel like it's incredibly likely. My only concern, and this is just coming from a, you know, an old school background, is that we're not gonna get physical releases. You know, I, I really like having a game on a disc, even if I am playing the game from a uh, digital download, I still like to have that. So my only concern would be that this would be a game that would not exist on a shelf and also not have a shelf life. Ken Horowitz of Sega 16 gave a presentation at Sonic and Sega Fan Jam in Georgia where he talked about how Fortnite is probably one of the most popular games that is not being properly preserved. There's no real way to play it offline in its older iterations. And once the game's dead, the game as we know it in its you know popular state will be dead. We're not going to be able to re-experience that. That's my fear is that Jet Set Radio 3 would be an always online game with 
a short shelf life. And if the game's a failure, then in one or two years after the release, it's gone. Especially if they decide they really want to kind of market this giant super game project. There is that possibility that this may just be part of that overarching project and we don't actually get a new game, but it's just going to be, you know, a little section of whatever Sega Super game they make. That would be pretty disappointing. I can't imagine something that's almost Battle Royale-like, where teams of players form gangs and fight over territory in like a big, huge city map, and they'd be like claiming areas using graffiti. And I know it's definitely not something that most fans would be thrilled to see, at least at first, but I can imagine having a lot of fun with something like that nonetheless. With facts, theories, and potential leaks in mind, it is enough to cause plenty of speculation that Sega could, in fact, be working on the next big Jet Set Radio title. Whether or not the leaks are true, if Sega were to make Jet Set Radio 3, it would likely turn out to be greatly inspired by the first game. Given its success at the time, Sega might also consider it a safe choice to pursue a reboot of Jet Set Radio instead of a sequel or remixed reimagining, as this would not only take the franchise back to its roots, but it would reintroduce the series to an entirely new generation. If this is what ends up happening, it is speculated that this could open the door for a possible reboot of Jet Set Radio Future. However, if the new game ends up falling in line with rumors of it mirroring a microtransactional model similar to Fortnite, then I don't think we would get a new Jet Set Radio game for a very long time after that. Sega's entire focus for the intellectual property would be centered on this new online model built around cosmetic purchases and season passes. That isn't to say it couldn't open doors for JSRF-esque content to be added to the game later on. I just love to have future on a Nintendo Switch. I'd flip out about that. I'd probably throw something through a window or like eat my CRT or something. <laughs> Because they're so derivative of the original so often, for guys like me, I just don't think there's a lot of hope for a future being, I don't know, just brought back in any way, shape, or form. All I really want to see is just, just give me a console port. Why is future still stuck on the original Xbox? Just put it on Xbox One and I'll be happy. If a game that's inspired by what you made 20 years ago is being featured pretty heavily in a Nintendo indie showcase, I think that kind of pulls your attention. I think once Bomber Cyberfunk drops, we're gonna hear a lot more about this new Jet Set Radio from Sega. There is a lot of people within the community that are creating mods or are games that are very reminiscent of Jet Set Radio like Bomber Cyberfunk, but with its own flair. And so I think creating a new game, people would be a lot more forgiving with that and would be willing to give it a new opportunity. 100% I would prefer a new Jet Set Radio game with a new original art style, story, designs, etc. More characterization would be good, a better mini-map. I'd love to see some new areas. You could even move it around a little bit, you know? Wouldn't mind seeing them skate around the snow in like a Hokkaido toe. If I'm gonna get another Jet Set Radio game, I don't need to play essentially another sort of origin story of Rokaku's, you know, taking over everything and we're the, you know, youth that got to stop him. I'd like to see some, you know, that formula needs to change a little bit. And besides, we've waited long enough. I think we need something a little more experimental with a third Jet Set Radio game, honestly. I hope that there's a lot more to do as well. I really love tagging and spray painting, but I want there to be other side quests and other things to do. I hope that we get something very similar to Jet Set Radio Future, if possible, mainly art style wise and fashion wise. My other speculation would be that I think we can definitely expect to see Jet Set Radio in animation in the near future. We've yet to hear any, any leaks or any announcements of a movie or TV show based on Jet Set Radio, but I think they are waiting for this potential third game to come out so that they can do a tie-in. Always good to be hopeful, just don't get your hopes up too high. The future of the Jet Set Radio series is one big blank slate. Unfortunately, we can't decide what goes on in it. What we can do is speculate, theorize, 
and voice our love for the series in whatever means necessary, even if a new Jet Set Radio game never comes. Something that I brought up with my team whenever we first met to make games is how impactful Jet Set Radio Future in particular was to me as a child and how the series and its message as a whole stands to me as an adult. Just bringing people together with these different attributes that just blend so nicely is, is something that's really awesome. It goes past just like being culturally significant to one person. It's easier to connect to a whole group of people, uh, which is really dope to see. We will continue that legacy even if the company that allowed it to form does not. What do you think about the possibility of a new Jet Set Radio game? Have any theories, speculations, or hopes of your own? Let me know in the comments, and I will feature some of your thoughts in a follow-up Q&A video. Thanks for watching, and stay funky. Love me too. Oh, yeah.